All right. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you here tonight. Um, it is 5.04, and I will call this meeting to order. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We can't suck. What? Where is it? <laughs> All right, Ms. O'Connell, roll call, please. Councilmember Borelli? Here. Councilmember No? Here. Councilmember Thomas? Here. Vice Mayor Saragossa? Here. Mayor Taylor? Here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will move on to our ceremonial items tonight. Um, item 3.1 on the agenda. This is a proclamation honoring the history and contributions of the Placerville Shakespeare Club on their 125th anniversary. And it's my honor to read this proclamation. Whereas in 1897, 20 ladies formed a club to study the works of William Shakespeare, naming their club the Placerville Shakespeare Club. And whereas in 1906, the members of the club aided in the establishment of El Dorado Public Library, and whereas in 1913 the club formed a civic group to clean up and beautify the city of Placerville, they also started PTA in the county and free kindergarten and promoted school bond issues. The same year they helped save Cedar Grove trees along Highway 50. And whereas in 1921 the Placerville Shakespeare Club incorporated with the state of California, and in 1929 the Placerville Shakespeare Club built their clubhouse, and whereas in 1940s, the club conducted blood drives for World War II. And whereas in 1951, the clubhouse was relocated to the present site on Bedford Avenue to make way for Highway 50. And since 1950 to the present day, the clubhouse remains a social club and event venue for the community. And whereas in 1983, the City Council of Placerville declared the Shakespeare Clubhouse a historic building and for over 36 years, club members have supported the Penny Pines Reforestation Program with monthly contributions. And whereas for over 35 years, the club has been awarding scholarships to women high school graduates funded by members and memorial donations. And now, therefore be it proclaimed, I, Kara Taylor, by virtue of the authority invested in me as mayor of the city of Placerville, state of California, do hereby honor and recognize the Placerville Shakespeare Club for their years of service to the community. And I would like to invite Ellen Osborne up to the podium, uh, president of the Shakespeare Club and member for 22 years. I think I can speak for the membership of the club and saying that we feel very honored and pleased that you have presented us with this proclamation. Uh, we're going to present it to the membership this coming Tuesday at our Silver Tea where it will be read and put on display. I'm very grateful to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. And if you want to hang on one second and I'll bring this down and present you with the proclamation. Would any council members like to make a comment this time? I'll just, you know. Ellen? 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 <laughs> just we're just, we're, just not, done talking we're, about we're not done with you. <laughs> <laughs> we just wanted to share with you. I want to share with you. I had my, uh, well, I, I hate to be so personal here. I, I had one of my wedding receptions wow. there, <laughs> my first one. And, um, and it, you know, and it's been, it's, it's awkward now, but it's been a, it's, it has been a great, what you guys have done maintaining that and making it available for our community to gather is a really an exceptional thing in this town. We don't have many places 
to gather in this town and, and with such a it's such a big room with a kitchen uh, I've been to many many events there over over the years and and I, I can't e express more our appreciation for what you do to maintain that make it available it's not very expensive you, you don't you don't get carried away with the pricing and, and, it, and it's it's in a reasonable thing and it's a beautiful building you guys have taken really good care of it so I just my appreciation for for our community for for having that asset and that resource in our community and it, it, the historical nature and what you guys have done in this town is just it's a great thing so I just want to express some appreciation for that thank you you we bet enjoy using it for our social events, mm -hmm. but we also really enjoy sharing it with the community mm -hmm. I've, I've got to say in my past life I was a caterer and I catered many events at the Shakespeare Club from weddings and baby showers and memorial services and I, I want to echo the sentiment that it is mm -hmm. a really special venue for the community where we don't have you know a lot of different options for um, a place for people to gather and until I read this proclamation I did not realize the just broad range of services that the Shakespeare Club and the women that founded it have provided to this community going mm -hmm. back to 1897. I was really blown away um, by by the service um, and commitment to this community from the Shakespeare Club. So I'd like to say that I'm a member of the Shakespeare Club <laughs> and very proud of it. Um, I joined in uh, 2012. And um, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that because I always thought, oh, they just read Shakespeare. <laughs> 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 and they just have reading, and that's not the case at all. They have so many groups, it's unbelievable. Reading groups, but gardening and, and uh, I don't know, I used to do tap dancing and, you know, just all kinds of things that they offer for the ladies in town. And I just, it's a great group to belong to, and I would encourage anyone who would like to become a member to let us know and maybe we can get you in. So, but congratulations. Thank you, Patty. And just one thing. Get on the microphone. Get by the microphone, we can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to emphasize our scholarship program. Oh yes, that. This yeah. year we gave out, in June we gave out seven $1,000 scholarships to graduating uh, women high school seniors and we've been doing that. I've been trying to find out when we started it, and it goes back so far, I haven't been able to find out. But at least since the early 1980s, we've given out many scholarships, and we're very proud of that. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to give the public an opportunity to speak on this item, if anyone would like to step up to the podium. All right, seeing none, I will close public comment on item three and move on to item four, um, closed session report. City Attorney Ibrahimi. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. The council did meet in closed session tonight. There was no public comments prior to meeting in closed session, and the council met on real property uh, negotiations with uh, arts and culture regarding 525 Main Street, and the council provided direction to staff. All right, thank you. That brings us to five, adoption of the agenda. I'd like to pull 7.6 and uh, adopt the agenda other, as otherwise. Second. All right, we have a first and a second. Can we get a roll call, please? Council Member Brelli? Aye. Council Member No? Aye. Council Member Thomas? Aye. Vice Mayor Saragossa? Aye. Mayor Taylor? Aye. All right, thank you. 6.1, uh, brief comments by the City Council. Let's start with Patty. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I attended the Women's Fund. They had their anniversary and honoring the club, uh, the 15 years and that they've been. And then um, that was a great success and a really nice evening. And then I'm going to put a plug in. We're going to hear about it later. But um, Saturday I helped clean up the cemetery. We're getting ready for our buried history. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... That's what I've been doing. Dennis? I look forward to the buried history. I'm, I plan on attending. And I, and I know that they're here, and, and I think everybody should attend because I think it's a great way to mm – -hmm. it's a lot about the downtown merchants this year, 
uh, merchants on Main Street and merchants in town and their history and legacy that they have left our community and I think I think that's an amazing uh, contribution that uh, to, to be discovered um, uh, let's see I, I had the opportunity to attend a forum here for all of the um, uh, people running for City Council and I think that was a, a great event well well done by the and appreciate the effort put forward by the League of California women voters um, and I want to, I don't think this is on the event. So um, Cal Cities has an opportunity for board members to sit on policy committees, and those are available right now. And so I don't know what the, all the policy committees are, but I just, it's in the back of my mind. I wanted to put that out there. So if you'd like to consider sitting on a policy committee, most of it's by Zoom, and you just talk about uh, policies that are coming up and how, what positions are important for small cities because this is a we have 57 different cities we represent from this board of Cal cities that I sit on and and those and it carries weight with the state and so it's important for us to if we want to to participate in the decision process of how we're gonna do this those so that's all I have for now thank you all right thank you Dennis Jackie um, I attended a workshop called Bridging Divides with the El Dorado Community Foundation. Mayor Taylor, Taylor, <laughs> Taylor <laughs> attended that also. That was kind of a uh, workshop talking about how to resolve conflicts in our community, and um, that was kind of the main focus. And then I attended Walk to School Day for Sierra and Chanel School. I think I've done that for quite a few years, and that's just always a really fun event for the kids and the community. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Jackie. Michael? I'm um, looking forward to um, going to the graves as well, see the graves. Uh, come by on Saturday if anyone's around. I'm across the street from the uh, uh, cemetery, so if you want to come say hi, just pop by my house. I don't know if I'll make it on Friday, but I'll definitely be there on Saturday, so I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I was also going to mention Buried History, but I think that that's been covered by everybody, but I, I am looking forward to that. And as Jackie mentioned, I attended the Bridging Divide workshop. Um, this was put on by the Community Foundation and several other sponsoring organizations. And it was, um, it was a really packed room of community leaders from healthcare and education and government and public safety, um, all there to try to find a way to kind of decrease the tension and divisiveness in the current climate. It was, it was really interesting and it was um, inspiring to see just a packed room of people that came together to participate in it. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to all of the candidates that participated in the candidate forum. Last week I attended as an audience member and it was fun to watch and um, I, I remember doing that four years ago and it was it's, it's just a really great way to meet the candidates, and you can, I believe, view it online if you weren't able to make it in person. So um, it's a great way to inform your votes on, on who the best city council candidates will be. And we wrapped up Trip to Green since the last meeting, and there will be surveys going out um, on Monday. And we really ask for feedback from community members, anyone that experienced trip to green businesses. We want to get a really comprehensive view of how it affected people and what worked and what didn't. So um, I hope everyone keeps an eye out for that survey. And it is really important that we get your feedback. So please fill it out. Um, and that's, that's all my comments for today. So we will move on to item 6.2. This is a presentation from our community, community utility liaison, Mark Acuna. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, good evening, council members and uh, department heads and chiefs. It's very nice to be here again. I was last year in May, um, and I will go through uh, several items that we have been working on um, with PG&E and city staff. Um, throughout the summer. Uh, perhaps the biggest one is um, the, um, the uh, being informed by P from PG&E that um, the microgrid or the generators on Broadway were defunded in January of this year uh, based on 
um, their reliance on uh, more sophisticated weather forecasting programs, they are now uh, finally confident that this region does not suffer from significant north winds, and therefore they will not be uh, putting a set of generators this year. That has been a huge uh, foundational piece to keeping some parts of town uh, with electric service during the past PSPS outages. Um, did you, I was, before we go beyond that, I, I think I would, because to me this is a really significant um, um, advance or admission by PG&E um, that their prior weather forecasting was massively inaccurate. And um, uh, it, it certainly takes a big load off, I think it should help take a big load of concern off everybody's minds. Um, just so the public understands, in the event, per PG&E, in the event that er, they foresee a wind event in this area, they feel that they have enough, they will have enough lead time to bring in a set of generators and have them connected before that event happens. Um, a little footnote is to the whole, uh, uh, Cleve, Mr. Morris and I have worked on this for five or six years probably. Um, at no time during any of the previous outages did the winds in the Placerville area meet or exceed PG&E's criteria for the, safe, the need for the fire safety shutoff. So um, I would like to just acknowledge, uh, you know, Cleve's assistance on this. Um, former fire chief, or interim fire chief Lloyd Ogan, uh, when I was mayor in 2019, um, he stood side by side with the city and anyone in the county that was interested and said, absolutely no need for this. You are creating an emergency inside of an emergency. Um, so uh, I say kudos to PG&E for uh, coming up, uh, uh, getting the right weather forecasting information and uh, getting that approved so that they are comfortable, I feel, basically removing us from the PSPS, uh, future PSPS outages. Is there any questions on that one? Uh, that one was the biggie. Mark, on that, um, thank you, and that's great news. So with that cover, do you think that covers the totality of the city or just portions when it comes to PSPSs? Because I know we're all, I mean, obviously we're all on different grids, if you will, in, in terms of the city. I'm confident that it's going to encompass um, the Placerville region. Okay. And, uh, again, um, we're talking about Placerville Highway 50 corridor. There will still be, uh, there's still a potential for outages on the Highway 50 corridor above Pollock Pines the Pollock Pines area and, of course, Georgetown Divide. Um, that's, a, that's a whole different wind program over there. But and, and for, Mark, there's still potential for our electricity being shut off if a tree falls on a oh, line. Oh, absolutely. Like yeah. So it's not that we're not going to have it, right. you know, but maybe we won't be shut down for three or four days, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's been a while now since we've had one. And exactly. um, it's, we're all quick to forget the buildup to that, the power going out, the wind never arriving, then because they shut it off, they then have to inspect every single inch of the de-energized facilities, which then, as Council Member Morelli noted, take, can take a day to two days and nights. All the while, nothing's really happened, but our power is out, you know, across thousands of households. So um, I, I, this is a huge step forward. I'm glad they've they can finally see what we were trying to gently tell them for the last five years. Gently? <laughs> you were pretty adamant. You did a really good job. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions on that one? Uh, all right, thank you. Um, just to share with the, uh, the, with the council, you've got my two-page uh, summary that I think Cleve presented as part of your agenda package. Mm -hmm. um, Patty and I think uh, Vice Mayor Saragossa, you've mentioned the outages. Uh, we did have the fire, they did have their fire safe switch settings, which were that really instantaneous outages. Um, this summer, those predominantly affected the north side of, of town, north of Highway 50. Um, luckily, most of those were resolved fairly quickly. So um, they did, you know, they did prevent the potential for an ignition. And thankfully, um, there wasn't a huge impact to uh, the citizens. Three or four hours is way better than two or three days. So. Uh, and I'm sure that that will be an ongoing program every summer. Um, 
the thing to watch for now is when they set the switches back um, so that they don't overreact when the wind does blow and it's pouring rain. So I'll, I'll kind of keep an eye on them. Um, the Placerville Weather Station, uh, that was something that back uh, when pg e was more interested in adding to their network. Uh, given the recent decision that uh, we were in a very low risk zone, um, as you can imagine, um, that uh, that that part of the uh, of their work has been removed, so they won't be doing any new cameras or any new uh, weather stations. No, I kind of note that without the PSPS outages, um, you know, we don't need as many standby generators perhaps as we did. So that's a, that's a plus. Uh, the underground feeder for the south side of Main Street. Um, I might ask the city engineer if she has heard from them recently. No, uh, we did a walk of uh, Reservoir Street back in May uh, with a couple of the PG&E designers. Uh, Brendan Sanders was with us and um, a PG&E construction crew foreman. Um, what we found out that, and as you'll notice, this is this is not going to be a complete undergrounding of that street. Um, they are still, uh, even with the reduced uh, wind exposure, they are still. Uh, proposing to go ahead with it. Um, they could have picked a more difficult spot, but I don't know how they would have ever found one. Uh, with conflicts and challenges, you can't even stick a shovel in the ground. Um, so um, we haven't heard back from them, and they were supposed to have started to do uh, potholing, where they were going to try and locate the more exactly the rock and some other existing utilities that are along, underground utilities along Reservoir Street. Um, I, I find it interesting that that, has not moved forward in throughout the summer, so I'll check on that. Uh, but when they get done, they will. Um, they intend to remove all of their overhead primary facilities, meaning the ultra high voltage, if you will. Um, there's some design question in my mind because low voltage wires have been known to start significant fires. So um, it was obvious. I, I think the engineer needs would agree that the day we walked it. There was a lot of, oh, wow, that's a lot of rock. That's a steep bank. This is a very narrow road, et cetera. So I'll check on that one for you. But uh, the intention is there, and it will be. It will solve the problem if we had an outage of, of the uh, south side of Main Street being out of power while the north side of Main Street remained in power. So more to come on that one. Um, Transmission switches, this was another important one. Uh, I am assured that that program is moving forward, and that's a good one. Again, it'll reduce um, the need for prolonged outages if we do have a windstorm because they'll be able to leave the 115,000 volt lines energized uh, in a safe manner so that they don't have to start you know, all the way back in Diamond Springs to restore the service to town. So hopefully they'll get that installed. Um, the Placerville substation building, this is a real positive. Uh, after several years, uh, Brandon Sanders and the PG&E paint department are to be commended. Um, we worked with them. Oh, we've been working with them for a while, but this spring we were extremely successful, and they have uh, gone in and uh, recognized that the building was theirs. It's probably been 40-plus years since it had been painted, and the uh, selected some very nice earth tone colors and have been doing a much better job in, in being a good, great neighbor on Broadway. So thanks to, thanks to Brandon. Um, he really uh, had to dig deep in the PG&E uh, Corporation to figure out how to get that accomplished. So thanks to them and the paint crew. They did a great job. Distribution hardening projects. This is a leftover from when we were a PSPS district. And since we don't have those concerns, uh, I'm not quite sure how these things are going to work out in the future, but uh, it's great that Daskaton Village is now completely served from the underground system from Broadway. Though Those residents don't have to worry. They have a much safer system, a much more reliable system, um, and that's an important facility with a lot of important neighbors up there. Um, they've also, uh, uh, with or without encroachment permits, this summer got the switching work installed on uh, Placerville Drive that is um, for our business districts. We've been talking to them for a couple of years about this. So this would be uh, Forney Road, Low Highway, um, all the Placerville Drive fairground area. 
that is all now removed from the outage risk areas and uh, um, will not be impacted near as what it would have been before we started on this. Um, the next item is the double poll issue. Um, that that in, is, is, is certainly an, a living challenge. Um, you know, a lot, not a lot has changed. I think city staff now has a much better understanding of all the requirements between the various owners of the joint poles that are along our streets and how the different utilities uh, interact with each other, the legal uh, restraints and obligations that are there. Um, my hat's off to uh, the city engineering staff and, and, and the parish planning staff for their work with um, trying to get uh, PG&E to understand that this impact is growing every week. Um, the example that I would ask the council and the public to go out and take a look at that um, I just double checked on this weekend is 555 Placerville Drive across the street from Clifton and Warrens. I think it's Tom, it was Tom's Burgers. The, uh, I'm confident that your city engineer and her staff spent at least two months communicating with PG&E because of the poll being hit by a car over a weekend. Yes, there was a police report. Yes, there's a responsible party in the repair of that poll. I would invite you to go out and take a look at what PG&E and the other utilities now consider work completed. It looks like a yard arm hanging off upside down off of a broken ship. I wouldn't want it in front of my business. I wouldn't want it along my business uh, boulevard. But this is an example of, oh, that's all we can do. Uh, it's, it's embarrassing. As a former engineer, absolutely unacceptable. So please, go by and take a look at that one. Mark, could I? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. I was just going to say. So, what do we, what do you suggest we do? Write letters after we go look at it, and I mean, is is there much merit in in the folks? Um, I also have a poll situation that was promised me, and it's still in my backyard. So, uh, and it looks terrible. Anyway, what do we do? Can I just mention quickly, Mark? Sure. Uh, you you were left out of this, but I know Brandon Sanders contacted Rebecca and has a meeting set up to discuss this topic with PG&E officials. I don't know if the date's been set yet, but 26th, is that what you said? Yes, October 26th. Thank you. So I just want to make you aware of that, Mark, that that he didn't contact you, went directly sure. to Rebecca I, I, on that, and we'll, we'll probably include you in on I that if you're appreciate available. It. So, yeah. as, as, but so there are some things happening there. We've been working on it. We think hope that there is a solution. We're going to continue to work on that. So. No, this is the whole double poll. <laughs> there, there's, I think Rebecca told me five, seven hundred, something like that, or I forget what the number was. It's a couple hundred now. A couple hundred, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> so there, anyway, there's a lot of them, and, mm -hmm. and we want to work on getting that resolved. So. That's a lot for five or six square miles. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, and they didn't do maintenance for 25 or 30 years, and... <laughs> I, I'm sure they're not, you know, on anybody's Christmas card list now from the phone company or Comcast or any of those because they are all drawn into this same big quagmire, if you will. Um, but, yeah, for the effort that I know Rebecca put in at 555 and for what we're left with, um, that is just, it's great in the fact that it's so bad. And, and then you can ask them to stand there and say, yeah, this is, is there acceptable engineering and public safety has been met. No way. So I would be happy to be a part of that, Clave. Um, I would let you know that uh, I can say this, you can. A city engineer has been very successful with getting PG&E's attention by stopping issuing encroachment permits. That is massively effective. Um, and while it seems maybe it seems a little harsh, um, you know, this is our community. We are the folks that understand that our little streets and our business districts and residential districts function a certain way. And a contractor comes here from Idaho and looks at it and goes, well, I can close this street all day. Nobody's going to mind. And he's looking at Pacific Street. And it's no big deal to him because, he's, you know, you have to remember there's no local buy-in anymore. All of these construction crews are from out of the area. They have no clue what a Possible Drive is compared to a you know, Cedar Ravine. Just, just give me a sketch and off we go. 
So, uh, my again, congratulations to, Re to Rebecca for her hard work this past year. Very time consuming, and, and I feel to a great deal very much unnecessary. So, um, but certainly appreciate your support on this. Um, and then lastly, the scenic highway and the crutchers permitting, as I've noted here. Um, one of the things that I realized this past summer is that, well, for example, the scenic highway ordinance, which is very much in force and very important, what was happening is um, it wasn't a, the inquiries weren't happening at the engineering level, design level, so that someone could start to take the scenic highway corridor rules into um, consideration. What was happening is those jobs were arriving in in city engineering's box wanting encroachment permits six months after the design work had been done and everything is locked in place. Um, so I don't know how successful we've been, but I've been hoping that we can push back to the engineering design level of the projects and say, hey, you guys are, you know, this is an important um, situation that exists along the highway and there are clear guidelines and we all need to follow along. So with that, I would be happy to answer any other questions you have. Well, thank you, Mark, for this report and for your consistent and continued advocacy for the city. Um, you know, when PG&E started doing the power shutoffs several years ago, I think that really got everybody's attention. But I think that a lot of people don't realize all the other issues that we deal with in terms of the double poles and uh, fixing up the Placerville substation, which looks so much better and um, I, I know that it, a lot of it has been your hard work behind the scenes um, advocating for us so thank you and also thank you to Rebecca for um, you know hold, holding their toes to the fire when it comes to getting proper permits and and all that so are there any questions or comments for no I just want to echo, echo the appreciation I have for Mark I mean this has been almost two straight years of, of advocating and conversations and bringing your expertise to the table to help us get where we are and I really appreciate all your efforts on behalf of the city thanks yeah, ditto uh, Mark um, I mean if every city had a Mark Acuna pg and &E, we'd be in some Ooh, serious yes. trouble <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> Uh, but no, I mean, for our, our little city, we're we're punching well above our weight with a giant corporation that could easily just ignore, you know, a lot of the sentiments that we're putting mm -hmm. forward. So um, kudos to you again uh, you. for that work and for mm -hmm. the continued work, um, because this is a huge development for us and for our yeah. city to, for our businesses. I mean, everyone that knows, you know, I, I, and even for the, the, the two and three hour ones, you know, people don't know how long their, their power is going to be out. You know, whether they send employees home, whether you stick around. So, having this not be able to happen for one, two days, three days is is a huge development. So, this yeah. is great, great news. The impact on our on on, on staffing, on uh, taxes, tax revenue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, on um, you know how many people are not going to have to go buy a generator now. That's. Uh, Everything. Yeah. There's, there's so much to that, and and you you have put in uh, the yeoman's work by far, and your knowledge and experience has, has been just uh, really great. But we're not done yet, so it sounds like you're quitting, and it sounds like it's over. But I have a feeling this is going to go on for a while. So uh, pre I, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want you going anywhere. I really appreciate what you do. Uh, thank you. And um, curiosity is my worst bad habit, I guess, because I'm really curious as to what they come up with on Reservoir Street. And I'm really uh, just shocked and dismayed as an engineer that some of this this double pole stuff is going on. And when I saw 555, I said, oh, no, I need to go call Rebecca. <laughs> we need to talk. This is not right. And, again, it's all part of the impact of this community. And, and they have an obligation as a um, oh, what's the word? franchise operating utility mm -hmm. to uh, – be a community, a good community member. So thank you for your support. It means a lot when I'm in these meetings with the big corporation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I will open this item up to the public in case there's anyone that wants to comment on 6.2. Sue Rodman. Lassville resident who has been subjected to PG&E's adages and I am extremely glad that we have Mark on our side 
because I think you've done a great job. Hang in there. Don't leave us. <laughs> PG&E is not uh, shaping up to be a whole lot better neighbor in the future than they have been in the past, but thank to you, they're better than they used to be. And uh, thanks to Rebecca, too. So hang in there and keep holding their feet to the fire and know that you have the community support, too. Thank you, Sue. All right, I will close public comment and we will move on to item 6.3. And Mr. Zeller has this verbal presentation regarding the Key Club Community Garden. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, if you recall, the City Council approved a service project for the Key Club at El Dorado High School. And for a little bit of background, the Key Club is an international organization for high school students. It's a student-led organization and uh, has the goal of encouraging leadership through serving others. Um, the Key Club's, Key Club's core values are caring, character building, inclusiveness, and leadership. And the El Dorado High School Key Club is sponsored by the Placerville Kiwanis Club. In keeping with the goal of leadership through service, the El Dorado Key Club will be building a community park or community garden in Duffy Park. Uh, the community garden will target individuals and families living in the nearby Cottonwood Senior Apartments and the Cottonwood Park Apartments and will provide an opportunity for families to grow their own food. Um, we've been working with the Key Club on some plans and uh, we also have two representatives of the Kiwanis Club of Placerville here tonight, uh, Sophie Cabrera and Tom Hinshaw, who are advisors for the Key Club. And we also have the president of the Key Club, uh, Jace Kaldunsky, who is here to provide an update on the club's efforts to date. Jace. Uh, hi, my name is Jace Kaldunsky. Um, thank you so much for approving this project a while ago. And now um, I'm back to give a little update. Um, so like uh, Mr. Zeller said, I am the uh, co-president of the El Dorado High School Key Club. And then I also oversee 11 schools in our region. Um, uh, as the district spirit coordinator. Um, so I'm pretty well involved with the organization. Um, so our club has raised just over $5,000 for this project. It'll be about ten dollars to $12,000 for the overall project. That's the quote we got two years ago. And then building materials prices just went woo through the roof. And so it was a little on a little bit of a hold there while wood prices went up and down and went all crazy. So now we're, um, we're hoping to start building it in stages, starting with a fence around the perimeter of the garden. And then we will start building garden bed uh, boxes, which will be built by the Eldorado High School's um, uh, wood shop program with Mr. Gunnarsson. And then we were getting uh, lumber donated by the Placerville Druids. Uh, and I think that's, yeah, we had a fundraiser. It was our end of summer bash. We had barbecue, a pie eating contest, raffles, um, barbecue. It was fun. It was, it was a blast. We, yeah, we raised just about $1,000 at that event. That's cool. Yep. That's cool. All right. Great. Jace, thank you for, uh, for coming tonight and giving us an update on this project that we, we had discussed what was it, a couple, two years ago? Two or? years ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to see it moving forward and that yes. you're bringing community partners to the table and getting donations and donating materials. It's, it's a great project. So thanks thanks for being here. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments for Jace or, or Terry? I'm um, just kind of wondering when it'll be available to the community. When do you foresee that date? My goal is before I graduate in May. No. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a senior this year, and I really want to see this project all neat and buttoned up before I go off to Santa Rosa Junior College in the next fall. So we are hoping to start building. I'm currently working on some grants through Key Club, and then I'll be applying for some grants through the Women's Fund as well. And hopefully we will get this going, and hopefully we'll have a fence. I have a contractor. I finally found a fencing guy. Um, I'm, I was excited about that. He's actually currently building the set for El Dorado High School's fall show. So I looped him in to build us some, um, some fencing. So hopefully by the spring we'll be able to start planting. Great. Thank you. So could I ask you a, a real quick question? Uh, the garden, who, who's going to do the gardening and um, is it and the results of 
<laughs> your bountiful whatever <laughs> who's so, going to receive that yeah so the um, the tenants of the Cottonwood Park apartments and the Cottonwood senior apartments will be the ones who are physically gardening in the garden it will be free to them they'll have to sign a little contract like they'll upkeep it because there is a limited amount of space there's going to be 16 garden beds in the space and so if someone's just signing up for it and then leaving it there when someone else could be utilizing that that's not fun. So we will be uh, keeping up with that and making sure that the families or seniors will be working and uh, in their beds. And then the Key Club will also be maintaining a garden bed outside of the garden. I've looked at a few different community garden plans for other community gardens. This is actually the first in our area, which is exciting. And so a lot of them will have, like, they call it a vandals garden outside. So it's so if you're going to steal, like, tomatoes from the garden, please take from this and not from the families growing. <laughs> Helpful, <laughs> nutritious food. So, Elder High School Key Club will be maintaining that, and then the um, the benefits from that garden and the produce will then be donated to a local food bank or food pantry. And I'm thinking, and I'm hoping that you're putting a great big tall fence around all this. Yes. So that's the big thing is putting <laughs> because a fence the deer around. are going to come and see you. Exactly. <laughs> yes. I live out in Somerset, and we that is our big problem is the deer, and mm -hmm. I, so we will be building a very large deer fence around the perimeter to keep deer. And anyone else who tries to get in, out. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> thank you. That sounds great. Yeah. And thank you. Uh, thank you, first of all, Chase. Uh, your effort in putting this on for the community, it's, it's, been a, it's, it's a process. Mm -hmm. And I think you're discovering all sorts of processes within <laughs> this. And, you know, all, and you're also discovering what it takes to put on a project and, and get people involved and get the city involved. And, <laughs> And there's, I, I wish I would have learned as much as you did at your age, because I'm learning some of those lessons <laughs> now on city council, and it's, uh, and it, they're, they're, they're good lessons too. Let me tell you. I also want to thank the advisors, one for being here tonight, and for all the work you guys do. I, I went through Key Club, and it was a foundational part of, of my being involved in, in community, and, uh, and I remember Bart Tamblin, who was my uh, advisor way back when. And, and he, had, he impacted my life in a meaningful way. And so I want to express my appreciation for what you two are doing in terms of giving back to the community in your way. So thank you. And thank all of you for what you're doing. So we would definitely not have this amazing opportunity if we did not have two amazing advisors to help us along yeah. the way. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, if anyone would like to comment from the public on this item, item 6.3, please step up to the podium. All right, seeing none, I will close public comment on this. And once again, I want to thank um, Jace and everyone for being here and for the update. And it's just great to see this moving forward. So take care. Um, next item is 6.4, and this is a presentation by the Placerville Fire Safe Council on the use of city grant funds. And Mr. Morris, do you want to introduce this or just? Yeah, just Sue Rodman will do the presentation. Okay. I don't need to do more. So All right, well, thanks. <laughs> Mayor and Council, I want to apologize for the screen quality. We're having some technical difficulties. Hopefully we'll have it fixed on the, at the next meeting. Okay. It didn't used to look yellow, <laughs> <laughs> but it does now. So anyway, yeah. Um, good afternoon. Mayor and City Council. I'm Sue Rodman and I'm here to represent the Fire Safe Council and their uh, Defensible Space Committee. And okay, next. the city financing that you gave us allowed the Placerville Fire Safe Council to establish a Defensible Space Committee and program to award grants to homeowners to help complete defensible space on their property. It's not a granted, I mean, it is a first come, first served program. And homeowners are contribute to the project, or they're appreciated, but they're not required to contribute for approval. Some of the participants have matched the $500 grant, but many have exceeded it, and some of them by double to quadruple the original grant. There are some steps for people to participate. First, you have to contact the Fire Safe Council and let them know you're interested, and then submit an application. We have an application that can be submitted online or it can be done for the homeowner. 
a trained evaluator then meets with the homeowner to evaluate the property so that they know what is a, what needs to be done on their particular property and they use the CPR 4291 standards so those are I believe those are statewide and you can see an uh, example of the marvelous residential clearance evaluation form and it's quite complicated so it's nice to have an evaluator who goes over the the evaluation with you and makes notations so that the property owner knows how this evaluation actually applies to their particular site and what needs to be done to meet those defensible space guidelines then the property owner obtains one or more bids from a licensed contractor and forwards the results to the evaluator and to date the bids have ranged from $500 to $2,500 the defensible space committee then reviews the application package and votes on approval and funding the evaluator sends a notice of the grant approval to discuss uh, how to go about it and or why their application was denied and this is an example of the letter that gets sent to them and it tells them okay congratulations you've been approved and then it gives them their next steps what they need to do and a time frame it started out as 30 days and we decided that really wasn't sufficient time for people to get this done so then we went to 60 days and then somebody said they thought that was too long so now it's actually at 45 days and then <laughs> to let them know that they can also ask for an extension if it proves that their contractors are too backed up to be able to do it once the work is completed then they contact their uh, evaluator and the evaluator goes and reviews that the work was completed as per the evaluation if the work meets the criteria then the fire safe council treasurer cuts a check for the agreed amount yeah. to date we've had 10 applications and evaluations that are complete five project bids have been submitted and approved and three projects are complete about forty four thousand dollars has been approved it hasn't all been spent because there's still two more projects <laughs> that have not completed and been funded yet and the projects are on a variety of property types size ranges from uh, city lots to small acreages and slope types uh, just like the rest of Placerville vary from almost flat to very steep um, the, the uh, vegetation types include very large trees small trees overhanging branches shrubs brush and grass and weeds the people the people who have participated in this in the fire safe council defensible space program are pleased both for their actual funding and for the evaluation to help them know what they need to do to provide defensible space on their home and property it's not enough to just look at the that the pictures that get provided to say this is what your defensible space should be and it's something else to have somebody who knows what they're doing to come and actually evaluate your property and let you know what's what needs to be done and it also gives them some documentation to take back to their insurance company that says this is what we're doing for our defensible space so you really shouldn't be canceling our insurance and the the other thing that the evaluator works with PR property owners to prioritize their vegetation work some of these places have a massive amount of work that needs to be done and it's more than can be done in one year so the work needs to be split over one more year and so the evaluator helps them to prioritize the highest priority for the for the current year and hopefully they can apply again next year to get to uh, additional funding to more, do more work on their defensible space 
and everyone understands that both the city funds and property owner funds are limited. We're, none of us are billionaires. And so the multi-year work responds to those limitations. Any questions? Questions for Sue? Well, thank you, Sue, for this presentation. I do okay. have a couple I'll questions. I'll give you a couple more things, and oh, okay. I'll need the lights down so you can see these. These are some before and after shots. It's kind of difficult to see against the yellow background, but you can see, and this is a before shot, how much of a fuel ladder you've got. Would they be taking no trouble for a fire to start at the bottom and go all the way to the top of these trees? And then this is where they have cleared done a lot of clearing to get this, especially right around this intersection so fire trucks can get through. This is a property where you can see that uh, there's a lot of overhanging branches and everything right up against the house. And then when the work was done, you can, now they can walk on their sidewalk. You can actually see there's a sidewalk there. Okay, and this is the front of the house where, is there a house back there? I think so. Now you can see that there is a house back there and they have some chance to survive a fire. So that is the end of the program. So any thank, questions? <laughs> thank you, Sue. A couple quick questions. What's the best contact um, email or phone number for the Fire Safe Council if people are interested um, in getting in touch? Either one, I would think, but probably email is the easiest. Okay, and what's the email address? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I should have put that in here, but I didn't. Okay. And then are evaluations available for people even if they're not applying for the grant, but they just want to have somebody come out and kind of give a professional opinion? Yes. Okay. And are those... Um, free or is there a cost? Yeah, there's, no, there's no charge for that. The Fire Safe Council is a, uh, not an official nonprofit, I guess, but yes, we are an official mm -hmm. nonprofit because El Dorado County's Fire Safe Council is an official nonprofit and we are under their umbrella. So okay. uh, no, we don't charge anybody to come and tell them, okay, <laughs> here's your problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that right there is a really great service to provide to the community because I think there's a lot of people that, you know, know they need to do something with their property but don't even know where to get started or what the main priorities would be, so. And I just want to uh, be sure and people are not, just because they ask this evaluator to come out doesn't mean that they're going to be obligated or reported mm -hmm. or anything like no. that because um, that, you know, people have asked that in the past, so it's all. No, it's a service. And Chris Kime is the one who does it. She does a really good job. She went and took a course on how to do all this evaluation. Mm -hmm. She's done a great job. Yeah, yeah if you're going to do evaluations, you need to take the training first so that you know uh, what you're looking at and whether you have any, uh, you know, if there's any problems or you get trained to see, okay, what vegetation types are you dealing with and what's their fire resistance, shall we say, or fire proneness. Yeah, but a lot of people have been, I think, more grateful really for the evaluation than they were for the money, especially the ones who said, okay, we'll take your $500, but it's going to cost us $2,500, and it's not a problem. We can do it. So. Yeah, my neighbor had the evaluation done, and just sort of for uh, the public, I mean, it wasn't, um, it, it, it was very, um, it wasn't burdensome. I mean, it, it was. They took into consideration the topography and everything else. So, I mean, they weren't moonscaping. You know, his his property. It was just very common sense things that could be done to to you know diminish the chance of fires. So, I want everyone to be that you're not going to have to clear cut your area. I mean, yeah, these, you they, look they at know the, the, this this house here. You can see it was just smothered basically, and now. Uh, do they still have landscaping? Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. Do they still have trees? Yes, they do. But they're a lot more fire resistant now than they were before. Before, the fire truck would have taken one look and kept kept on going. Mayor, just just quickly, we looked up the online. It says the email address is placervillefsc 
at yahoo.com. Does that sound right, Sue? Yeah, so, that okay. does sound right. So. All right, great. Thank you. Thanks. That additional information. All right, any other questions or comments before we let Sue head back to her seat? Thank you so much for, for coming tonight and for presenting this information and letting the community know about the grant program and the evaluations and the good work that you are doing. We have several members of the Fire Safe Council here tonight, Mark Acuna and Patty Borelli up here. So, well, we um, thought the city council ought to have a, a, a little update on what we're doing with your money. Yep, <laughs> appreciate that. Um, I will open item 6.4 up to the public. If anybody would like to comment on this, please make your way to the podium. All right, seeing none, I will bring it back to the council. And we will move on to item 7, the consent calendar. Um, so we've polled item 7.6. We didn't. We, did. we shouldn't have done that. I, I, I spoke out of turn there. We need to pull it now. Okay. Yep. To, to do it right. All right. All those in favor of pulling 7.6? Aye. 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 Okay. Look, we got to um, actually public comment on consent yes. calendar. Also, yeah. um, okay. So we will open item 7.1 through 7.5 up to the public at this time if anyone would like to comment on the consent calendar. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council. Okay, I'll move the consent calendar with the exception of 7.6 and we'll pull that. Second. All right, we have a first and a second. Although, uh, Regina, roll call please. Councilmember Borelli. Aye. Councilmember No. Aye. Councilmember Thomas. Aye. Vice Mayor Saragossa. Aye. Mayor Taylor. Aye. Thank you. All right, that brings us to the public comment portion of our agenda tonight. Um, this portion of the meeting is reserved for people that wish to address the council on non-agendized items. Um, if you would like to make a comment, please step up to the podium when we open up public communication um, and state your name voluntarily for the record. It is appreciated and keep your comments to three minutes or less. Very good. Ed Ingram, Glasserville, Clay Street. Been here a couple times before. Just want to say a couple good things and bad things about the city. Mr. Morris, appreciate all your efforts. You got a terrible job, but you do a great job at what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you very much. City Council, Mayor, Vice Mayor. You guys do awesome. Chief Wren, thank you. <laughs> Perfect. All the rest of you guys. Rebecca, all you guys. Perfect. But <laughs> go green, right? Yay, go green. Everybody go green. Keep it up. It's a pilot program. Don't give up on it. Please keep working with it. It's all good. Perfect. I love it. Thank you. A couple other things, just for notice. Glassville Station 2 going to be shut down for another year, possibly. And eh, doggone it. You know what? These people doing donuts, speeding through the driveways over in the thing. Stop them. Put some barricades up. Let's control this thing. Let's get some signage up, police it, take care of it, okay? Some of your guys' vehicles have been splattered by people doing donuts with rocks, public with dust, stop it, okay? Uh, need more patrolling, evenings. Yeah, darn it, it's getting towards winter and fall, getting colder. These guys are coming in, they're spending nights, hanging out longer, a little bit more of a pestering community. You live there. Put them in your front yard, please, okay? Or take them away from mine. All right, love it, perfect. Uh, landscaping, eh, what the heck, you know what? On the west side of the new facility at phase two, yeah, get rid of the oak trees, put some good stuff in there, put some concrete, color it, it's all good, okay? Um, base lift. I don't know, my wife wrote this for me. I can't tell what it is. <laughs> anyway, you guys are doing a great job. Please continue. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you Ed. <laughs> Sue Rodman, Placerville. That was really nice to see a trip to Green when you could be able to go downtown over Labor Day weekend and be able to get through town and go where you wanted to go and not be absolutely jammed. 
I thought it was a great success all three days. Thank you, Sue. Hello, uh, Tammy Dans, uh, long-term, well, homegrown, put it that way, in a different meaning, uh, same. Anyways, as far as the bus station goes, he already covered that, but it could really use a facelift. You're getting ready to start a whole new phase, and it's going to look nice and pretty, and the bus station is just falling apart, looks horrible, and along with that comes, you know, it just looks trashy. Um, so... You guys have talked about doing some improvements with it. I don't know where those funds went, but apparently not there. Painting, there was something along that line at some point. And then um, I noticed that um, there is a, a clothes and shoe locker that has just appeared down at the gravel area um, at the bus station. I don't know if that's really an appropriate place to have that. We're already having issues of people dumping things there for the homeless or whoever. And I think that's just kind of encouraging more of that. I think maybe a better location might be like the Ivy House parking lot, you know, something that's a little more visible, just a suggestion. And once again, go green. It was a lifesaver. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Tammy. Hi, I'm Mike Roberts. I'm with the County Cemetery Advisory Committee. And uh, I would just like to ask the city to uh, keep a better eye on Placerville Union Cemetery. Uh, to, it would be, the city used to lock the gates at night and open them in the morning. Uh, that hasn't happened now for about five years. Uh, so the cemetery is wide open for anybody to come in during the night and do whatever they want. And they do. So uh, it would be great to see the gates locked. It would be great to see the cemetery patrolled. Thanks. Any questions? Thank you for your comment. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. Jonathan Gainsborough. Hard to compete with such brevity. Um, I'm thrilled about the future navigation center, which was approved after the uh, turn down of Perks Court and Perros and that whole dance. And um, you all actually... Yeah. You led the... Uh, you led the county in stepping forward with your compassion. I don't know why the feedback is here, but it doesn't... Just... Hang, on, hang on one second, John. I'm going to turn the podium off for a second. And so um, okay. a couple of things. Um, a friend of mine overdosed at Hangtown Motel. She was uh, doing straight fentanyl. Uh, Should have killed her. Uh, but when they, her daughter came out, 20-year-old, and screamed for help, it, it took quite a while to find some Norcan. Uh, I'd like to have the office there equipped with like five or ten doses. Also, a fire extinguisher there and a fire ex uh, just offered, I, I think it would be beneficial and accepted by the, the owner there. Also, up at Taqueria, uh, uh, Tijuana, at the other end of the 60 or 70 tents. Uh, planning to fail is failing to plan, but actually it's better the other way. Failing to plan is planning to fail. So it is getting cold at night. And we're, they're looking at a January 15th opening of the Navigation Center, which is great. We have 600 uh, homeless, uh, quite a number of couch surfers, but also um, maybe 100 are sleeping in their cars, and it's going to be below freezing. I, I want to ask you to lead the way in compassion to create something that's viable when it gets to be freezing, but at least by mid-November until mid-January, that's 60 days, 48 seconds left. If it is illegal and 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 uh, criminal to leave dogs and cats that are pets open in a in a fenced yard when it is freezing rain and snow, let me ask you: Is it also criminal to leave? 
hundreds of people with no shelter during the same season when it's freezing rain and snow. Of course, it is criminal. It is criminal, and we need to do something to plan ahead. You opened up last year the former DA Center. There is not going to be any nomadic shelter. The churches are burned out. The volunteers are not stepping up. But we've got to ask you to lead the county to do something for the homeless. Time is up. God bless you. Let's do it ahead of time. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I don't know why there's so much feedback on that microphone. Is there... Sorry about the um, feedback, Jonathan. We, we could hear you. So. <laughs> All right, any other public comment? I'll take his extra 10 seconds. Um, you know, the last time when I talked about going down one way on green, that it would be good that we didn't just accommodate those people traveling through Placerville, but actually promoted the city as a destination point. You know, much like Old Sacramento, the second largest town in California during the gold rush. And here we are, the third. They make millions of dollars in tax revenue every year from millions of visitors. And then when I brought, brought it up, I was reminded that the Chamber of Commerce has a contract with the city, and that's true. But I don't know of anyone who has a contract and just leaves it up to the person who's receiving the contract, doing the contract work, to do the planning. They get direction. We go to a restaurant, we don't give them a credit card and say, hey, serve me what you want, nor when we want a house, do we give them a check and say, hey, build it any way you want. We give them direction, and that's really long overdue. Um, it seems very appropriate. Um, it can be put on your calendar in the future before the end of the year, but it needs to be done because we can make money and promote the city uh, in a way that makes us unique. If you don't like the nickname, Hangtown, just use what was described in the 1860s by an historian. It was the capital of the mother load, and that's what we are. So uh, I strongly recommend that. And when we talk about the chamber, I'm a capitalist. I grew up in a family of merchants. I believe in competition. If you don't have competition, it doesn't necessarily produce the best work because the same people also promote wineries and they promote Apple Hill. So it's kind of a divided interest. There's no reason for them to go out and do something original because they have an exclusive contract, a no-bid contract, to, in essence, do what they want. We need to have you put out a contract and come up with some money. I mean, my friend John Diagostini gets a half million dollars to put a bronze statue in front of the place and gets another half million just last month for an armored vehicle. And then from the county gets a quarter of a million dollars for bullets and has a provision in the resolution that says they can come back for more money, quote, as needed. Great deal. So I just think you ought to do that. And, uh, and just to let you know my personal experience of being on the member of the PDA, the uh, commerce folks had my email address, and I would get these invitations for mixers. I will tell you that next time because we've only got about 15 seconds left. But it, it really illustrates why competition makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk. All right, I see nobody else stepping up to the podium, so I will close public comment. There were a couple of questions that were raised regarding um, the Placerville Station 2. Rebecca, that project, th th this is actually on our agenda for later on, um, the start of this project, but maybe you can just very quickly kind of give a timeline for when the gravel will be replaced with, you know, closed um, up. And so these are all part of my talking points on a later agendized item, but I will say that uh, we are working with the contractor and their start date. They have some pre-existing commitments on other projects. It could be as soon as November. It could be as late as March. Okay. And then as for painting the bus station, mm -hmm. 
I believe going off of memory, and maybe you guys can help me out here, is that it is included as a CIP project for this year's budget with El Dorado Transit Authority. Does that... I, I'm I'm unaware of that. Okay, I'll check on that and I'll I'll get back to you outside of this meeting. But I I do believe that there are plans underway to make improvements. I was going to say, isn't that under the auspices of transit or transportation? Which is yes. It is. My understanding, we've had that discussion with him. Terry has, but mm -hmm. it has not yet been funded by transit. To okay, I'll I'll double check on that because I do feel like I've seen that as a capital improvement project but I'm going purely off of memory here so <laughs> don't don't quote me on that but I, I will check on it um, all right I got one more thing to add so as far as the, the Narcan you were talking about that is readily available at just about every pharmacy and they can go in and ask for a prescription of that and get it received so all those people up there have access to Narcan and even even people that help other people or that are in the presence of other people that might be doing drugs legally have the ability to have access to Narcan. So there's a, the, the availability of Narcan in this or naloxone, depending on <clears throat> where you're getting it, but the, the availability of that in our community is, is significant. Every prescription that comes in gets a, generally with a narcotic, gets a prescription of Narcan to come with it. So those most all doctors are required to prescribe it or make sure they have it. Pharmacies are required to provide it if it's if it's needed. So those that the availability is there for so that. So that daughter could have had it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, 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 it isn't. Well, I don't want to get into the details of this. I just wanted to make sure that the availability is there when they, an overdose occurs and they're still alive. The availability of using it is there. So. Thanks for providing that information. Um, Regina, is there any written communication? No, Madam Mayor. Okay. So we will close public comment. I want to thank you all for coming and providing feedback to the council. We really do appreciate hearing from you. Um, and we are moving on to item nine. This is items pulled from the consent calendar. So we pulled 7.6. Um, and thank you, Dennis, for doing that. I was going to pull this item because I have a conflict on November 15th, and I believe, Michael, you do as well. I do as well, um, correct. So I would like to propose November 9th for that meeting, if it works for everybody else. That works for me. Let me check. Yep. Okay. And, and, and I, I confirmed that the facility is available that okay. night for the meeting. I'm, gi I'm giving up a night. I haven't talked to, to staff yet. Oh, about I was going to say, how about <laughs> staff? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, I would make a motion that we <laughs> so move amend this. We'll go, to we amend the this date. and we'll meet the ninth instead of the fifteenth. Yep. All right. Okay. I'll second. I'll second. We have a first and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Mm -hmm. Oh, I forgot public comment. Thank you. Mm. We'll uh, you can do it. <laughs> open this up to public mm -hmm. comment. 7.6. All right. I see none. I'm going to close public comment. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have nothing under ordinances tonight, nothing under item 11, public hearings, which brings us to our discussion items. And we'll start with 12.1. This is to adopt a resolution awarding grants to be to selected applicants for the Community Benefit Grant Program. And Mr. Morris has this staff report. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Um, so included in this year's budget, the council uh, included five thousand dollars for uh, community grants and um, in July the council approved the program that was designed and asked staff to begin advertising the program and and set up those guidelines and um, receiving applications uh, we did that uh, and the applications were due uh, by September 15th we did receive I should know that number <laughs> We received, um, I believe it was, let's see, one, two, 11, 12 applications. And 
uh, evaluated those based on the criteria. You appointed council members Borelli and No to be the committee to review those applications. Uh, they did that uh, based on the requirements of the grant and came back with the recommendations that are in your report. Uh, and we received a, a recommend, uh, application, I'll go through what these are, from uh, Community Pride Kathy Lishman to refurbish the planters in the Fox lot. That one was approved for $1,000. Uh, also from Community Pride from Josette Johnson regarding uh, repair and add lighting to the Snowshoe Thompson Monument. For those, if any, that don't know where that is, it's at, at the corner of the um, Mel's parking lot right at the corner of Pacific and, mm -hmm. or excuse me, Sacramento and Main Street. Um, that was approved for uh, $500. El Dorado Historical Society um, submitted an application to restore the Snowshoe Thompson mural that's on the uh, corner there also at Sacramento and Main Street on the side of the building. Uh, submitted an application for $1,000. It was approved for $850. Uh, they noted in their application that they would probably be willing to uh, uh, increase, uh, at match some of those funds uh, to make that a complete project. Um, Sierra Community Access TV submitted a proposal to do a production regarding the history of Main Street in Placerville. They requested $1,000. That was approved uh, for $750. Um, uh, buried History uh, proposal was submitted by Andrew Vondersmith. Uh, that uh, request of $1,000, that was approved for $1,000. And then uh, Boy Scouts of America and, and Eagle applicant uh, submitted a, pro a project. Uh, he wants to install a diff disc golf course at Markham Middle School. And he requested $1,000. However, in his application, it mentioned a whole sponsors would cost $900 to sponsor a whole. And so the committee approved $900 uh, for that to be a whole sponsor at Markham Middle School. Um, the other applications I'll, I'll mention quickly that were not approved. Uh, one was actually came from Oren Miller. Um, for those of you who may or may not know, he's the actual artist for the Snowshoe Thompson mural. Um, he did not meet the, the uh, uh, nonprofit status as we had required. However, since the, the El Dorado Historical Society also submitted the same project, we believe that that will be done and will be funded as, as part of that, that process. Um, <clears throat> Moore re submitted an application for their outdoor gardens, requested $1,000. Uh, that wouldn't, in the co whole competition process, was, was not approved. Um, felt like there was also a lot of uh, synergy going on with that project and it, it is moving forward, so um, it was not approved. Um, the Fire Safe Council requested funding for education, materials, and dumpsters. Um, we felt like we already gave the Fire Safe Council $5,000 and didn't feel it was appropriate, uh, decided not to give them more under this grant. Um, the Elders Community Fund requested materials for their resource center. Um, the committee did not feel that that met the, the goals of the, the grant program, which were beautification and, and tourism. I forget the third word in there, but generally that type of thing did not feel it met those, those requirements. And then the El Dorado County veterans uh, submitted an application for some uh, bronze sculptures that they want, veterans monument, that they want to install at the veterans monument. Um, their, their total project is $200,000. They requested the $1,000, and uh, the committee did not fund that one. Um, just in the competition of the others, they felt the others were more important. So that's an outline of what the committee did. Uh, council members know and... Brella, if you want to add anything that I missed, I'm happy to let you do that. Um, I don't think you mentioned the landscaping at 515 Main Street that we... Oh, yes, you're right. I skipped over that one. That was from, um, where is it? El Dorado Gold requested um, uh, $1,000 to complete landscaping at their building that they have on the corner of uh, Bedford and Main Street, uh, 515 Main Street. and and. Uh, the committee did not approve that that grant also so 
there any questions? Do you want to say anything more about that? Yeah, I just, um, like I know we had looked at the two landscape um, projects, and those are on private property, and so with the limited funds, we really focused on the, the public venue, and also, you know, our, our purpose was history, tourism, and beauty, and so the other ones, you know, not all of them really seem to fall into that. Mm -hmm. So we tried to do the most we could with that 5,000 to focus on the public venue and, and those, the mission of those three items. Well, I want to thank you and Patty um, for putting the work in and going through this. Uh, you know, it's, and it's not an easy chore because no. everybody, I mean, it's, they're all great projects. All great and, projects. you know, so mm -hmm. we had to really kind of sift through it, and like Jackie said, and, you know, um, so that we could come up with what we did. But it seems like your reasoning was very sound, um, and I think that we, you know, it's, it's great to see people applying for this, um, and with all great projects that really benefit the community, community and I'm excited for the ones that are selected. Um, and we felt, know. too, that the, the ones, even though we didn't finance it, it's going to, they're going to mm -hmm. happen, so. Yeah. yeah. I was really happy when you didn't pick me for this committee, <laughs> <laughs> and I really appreciate the, the, the time and energy because I know what it takes mentally and emotionally to go through this and you know you're letting people down but you're also helping people out it's a, it's a real you know it's a, it, it takes a toll on you and, and it's a commitment to, you know it's actually you're putting something out in the community and you become a target for some people if they don't like it and and so it's, I really appreciate what you guys did. And I'm, you know, I, I, I wouldn't mind doing it, but I'm really glad you guys did it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions for Cleve or the ad hoc committee that worked on this? Comments? No? Okay. We'll you open this. Do you want to say anything? No. no. Okay. We'll open this up to the public if anyone would like to comment on 12.1. Mike Roberts again, not to complain this time, uh, but to say thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, our pioneer cemeteries uh, connect us with uh, the past of our community, uh, and they uh, build the fabric of our community. They, uh, they build community. Uh, we saw it on, on Saturday at the cleanup. Uh, it was a lot of fun, and uh, people got engaged with each other and with the place. So uh, thanks a lot. We'll try to... Earn it. Appreciate it. See you on Saturday. Thank you, Mike. Hello, Nicole Gottberg, Placerville resident. Um, I just had a question, as some of these are partially funded, I agree with the whole list and I agree with doing that, but if for some reason they aren't able to raise the additional funds to move forward, is there some a sunset date or means by which that money would come back to the city council if the project doesn't proceed. Thanks. Thank you, Nicole. All right, I see no other uh, comments, so I'll close public comment on 12.1. Um, in terms of the partially funded projects, I know that this was a question that I asked uh, when we were going over the agenda review, and I know that all the ones that are partially funded, they did say that the project would move forward even if they were not granted the full amount. Do you have any more information about, you know, timelines or any sort of, like, accountability for the... I also wanted to make one more comment. Okay. Um, on the one that... Uh, this the Snowshoe Thompson um, Monument Repair and Lighting, we actually decided to fund the lighting, not the monument repair. So just Correct. to be specific, the $500 would cover the cost of that part of the project. They don't need to raise any more money for that. Okay. And, you know, we had talked about the city looking into what would be the monument repair because we didn't actually, they didn't have a quote for that. We didn't have any idea what that was. Right. So we funded what we knew. And then, you know, that's something that we can still look at as a city in the, in the future okay. for those sorts of things. But um, as far as the other partial funding, I do have a bunch of notes we made on that. Um, for, like, the history on Maine, um, had, like, $200 for lunches and stuff like that. So we said, well, you know, they have to buy their own lunch. Um, so we, we felt pretty confident that that project could continue. 
um, also, and like I said, the refurbished said the historical society said they would put matching funds. So if they matched what the city had put up, that should cover the cost of that. So we felt pretty confident that everything would still move ahead um, according to the notes that, that were submitted. Okay. And then in terms of um, if, I don't think that this will happen with these projects, but it is a good um, point just to think about, you know, if we did grant funds to an applicant and the project was never completed, is there anything in place to... So I, I think w for the most part, we will require them to show that they're fully funded before we give them the money. That'll be kind of our last phase. So the they project completed will, the project. Well, no, that they, I, I don't know. We we, we talked. A timeline, did we? we did not. We did. We talked about whether or not we would require them to complete the project first, and we also discussed if, as long as they can show us that they need that funding mm -hmm. before they complete it. That you know, it might have to be paid up front. Uh, we can work with them on that. We did have um, all of these did say, by the way, uh, that if it was only partially funded, it would still move forward. I believe the there was one that said probably, but I'm, I'm uh, but but uh, they all did check the yes box on okay. that. Um, the one concern was that I had a little bit, but I think there is a timeline on that. Is actually the the disc golf course. He needs to raise nine thousand dollars to do that for ten holes that he wants mm -hmm. to do nine hundred dollars per hole. So um, I, I think that's one that we want to make sure that he has. I know that. I know the scout program. He does have a deadline to be able to <laughs> meet meet that requirement for the, his Eagle Scout project. So uh, that might be a timeline for him. But I have no idea what that is either. So I, I think that we we kind of play it by ear with them and see where they're at. If we go, you know, the end of this fiscal year and they're still not there, we may need to come back and reevaluate. Re but that's kind of a timeline that I would look at. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've got to say this was one of the, the budget items that I pushed on and not everyone was as enthusiastic as I was about doing this grant program, but it does make me really happy to see the city taking part in supporting the, the good ideas and good work that comes out of its residents to, to make the community a better place. So I'm really happy to see this item and I once again want to thank everybody for their hard work on the, the committee making the tough decisions on which ones to fund. Any other comments? One of you two want to move it? Okay, I'll move item 12.1 uh, 12 point, 12 point as presented. Yep. All right. We have a first and a second. Can we get a roll call? Sorry, Madam Mayor. Who was, who was the second? Jackie. 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 Okay, Council Member Borelli? Aye. Council Member No? Aye. Council Member Thomas? Aye. Mayor, Vice Mayor Saragossa? Aye. Mayor Taylor? Aye. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, 12.2. Um, this is to appoint a public member to the Cannabis Community Benefit Committee, and Mr. Morris has a staff report. Thank you, Mayor and Council. As you recall, in 2018, uh, you adopted an ordinance to allow retail cannabis businesses in the city. Uh, part of that program talked about a cannabis benefit uh, uh, fund or program that the city would do. Um, the city adopted a program in 2020, which basically requires uh, that each cannabis business contribute 1% of their gross revenues to, uh, the, the, to the program. Um, and that has been going on since they started. There was a, a, a phase-in period for that. Quarter one, they did 0.25%. Quarter two, 0.5%. Quarter three, 0.75%. And then after a full year, they, they contribute 1% going forward. Um, so the, our two businesses that we have open and operating have been doing that. They've been, both been open for actually a year now. Just uh, Sacred Roots just completed their first year. So both are now contributing the full 1% of their revenues towards this program. Um, when you set up the program, you define the, the members, which would be um, the chief of police or designee, city manager, manager or designee, uh, the community services director. And then you had one per public member. And at that time, we assumed three uh, cannabis business representatives, one from each of our businesses that we anticipated having. Since that time, as you know, we've only approved two uh, cannabis retail businesses, so there would only be two representatives from that. Um, so you may want to 
take a look at that, something to consider. Um, if you want to change that, I believe this was adopted by resolution, so we need to bring a, back a resolution to change that. Because of the fact there's only two cannabis business representatives, it makes that an even number, which we usually try to avoid on committees to avoid ties that we can't resolve. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that up to you whether or not th this is, I think, a little bit easier. I'm not real concerned about that issue, but, but we could take a look at that. Um, for the program, um, you addressed the following uh, potential projects, programs that could be part of the used for the funding. Uh, public safety equipment, city youth recreation scholarship program, Plasville Police Department cadet program, uh, community cleanup costs including trail maintenance, um, student scholarships, drug outreach education materials and programs, Habitat for Humanity Senior Assistance Program, youth programs, Boys and Girls Club, for example, and others that, that may come up. So it's not inclusive. It's not that they have to fit in that specific guidelines. There's others that could be raised that the committee could look at. Um, at this time, what we are looking for is to appoint a public member. Um, I've talked to some of you about this. Uh, if we don't have that tonight, we do not have to do it tonight. There's no real deadline on that to say we need to move forward. I've noted in the report, um, as of June 30th, we had $34,000 in the fund, so there, that money is available to use toward these programs, and probably a little bit more now since we've earned since, since June 30th. Um, so at this time, I'll, I'll give it back to you, Mayor, to see how we want to proceed with this. Uh, we could there's, there's options. If you wanted to, we could put out an, a request or recruitment if you wanted to do it that way. Um, if you want to uh, just talk to people and recommend someone and then vote on them, we can do it that way too. So I'll leave it up to you. All right. Thank you. Um, does anybody have people that they've already spoken to about this? Or would like to appoint? You know what I would like to suggest, maybe, <laughs> is that since we only have um, two of the cannabis operating, that we maybe um, have two public members instead of, you know, so that way we'll have uh, the seven-member committee instead of six. Um, I agree. And I, I think it would be, and I know this is more time-consuming, but to have folks maybe submit a reason why they would like to serve on this committee instead of us because uh, we don't know all the great people out there you know and, I'm, <clears throat> and I, I've reached out to a couple of people but I haven't gotten any response <laughs> I think I think that we I think that they should uh, contact their um, council member of choice and ask mm -hmm. that they be considered um, I don't want to go into a whole selection process. I think that the five of us should be able to figure this well, maybe out. Maybe we could invite folks to call us. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If they, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. let's. Um, and does it have to be a city, a city, um, somebody that lives in the city? I think it should be. Yep. I think. There's no guidelines that say it has to be, but I think that was anticipated. Certainly, that certainly the funds are. should be spent within the city limits. Yes, yeah. th those have no, to be. But yes. that the, the people that we're appointing live in the city limits. I was going to say resident or business a resident. owner. Or business owner. Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess I guess that would be okay. Yeah. No. No. I would like it to be a city resident. Okay. You know, the county has their own program for doing what they want, whatever they're going to do yeah. in the county, and this is really a city program. The only... The only kind of nuance to that is there's a lot of people that live just on the edge of the city whose kids go, you know, do clubs in the city, use the parks in the city, and they might have, you know. We do have ideas. a map of a sphere of influence. We have but sphere. I think, but, yeah. But, but um, how complicated do you guys want to make this? Very simple. Let's make it, <laughs> let's make it a city, city resident. And, um, I mean, we have 11,000, almost 11,000 yeah. people. We, we should, should be able like to find me. two people out of 11,000. This seems like the funnest committee to be on. <laughs> <laughs> so I would think that people would be. Yeah. I know, just chomping us. at the bit to get on. <laughs> to figure so, out where to put this. So we could put something out on, um, Facebook, Facebook or something or to, media. to contact, uh, a, 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 uh, Council member of their choice. And let's bring it back at the next meeting. Yep, yeah. I agree. Yeah. So, so, we're gonna so we'll bring the resolution back so also to add two. Yeah. Uh, another yeah. additional I, public member. Yeah. Can we do that? That's not a whole lot can of Can we time. do that quick enough? To we can do this. Yeah, we can get it at the next, okay. next meeting. Two I mean, to, to add let the other people members, know because and we have to change the ordinance this. and everything, right? Well, I know we can, but okay. It's just a defined resolution, not ordinance. Okay. No, just so they would find out. Yeah. 
Okay. We got this. So that is, I think maybe we can get it. We could table this until next meeting. Well, do we want to? We will. With those instructions. Do you need a motion because we're going to add? We want to add another. You you members. should do, you should do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. have a motion to add one member. I'll, and bring it back I'll make a motion that we add. Hang on, hang on. I'm going to pause you. Let's do public comment. Oh, you're right. <laughs> okay, we will open up 12.2 for public comment. <laughs> okay, we'll close public comment. <laughs> Nice. That was a blast. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and make a motion that we uh, add an additional public member and that the public members be residents of the city of Placerville. Second. All right. Mm, and that they come. Then, can I can I ask that you add that they bring this back at next meeting? And that they yeah, and that this item is brought back at the next city council meeting. Yeah. Second. All right. We have a first and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, motion passes unanimously. And um, for anyone watching this meeting from home, please, if you are interested in being in the Cannabis Community Benefit Committee, which will probably meet, what, two or three times a year, Cleve? I would think so. And uh, determine oh. where the cannabis business dollars are put to use in the community, get in touch with right. one of your council members. They'll make a recommendation back to the council on yep. those projects, but yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to item 12.3, and this is approving a construction contract for the Placerville Station 2, Phase 1. And Ms. Neves, our city engineer, has this report. Good evening, Mayor Taylor and council members. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present this item to you this evening. It's been 16 years in the making. So uh, the Placerville Station 2 project is one of those projects that everybody knew about but almost knew nothing about. Um, the site, often referenced as the dirt lot next to the park and ride, is about to become so much more than that, and I'm happy to say it also completes the work on Mosquito Road within the city limits. We can finally check that road off the list for now. Um, Placerville Station 2 is the second phase to a project started in the early 2000s. The city purchased the land using an AQMD grant and also began scoping a project in environmental clearance and then the search for funding. In 2006, it was adopted as a project in the annual budget and funded through a grant through the Sacramento Regional Transit sponsored by the Federal Transit Authority. Over time, utility work was added and then removed and then included in other projects. There are other parts of this journey, like considering this to be the site of a future hotel possibly, and after several years of patiently waiting for an answer, that answer was no, and staff had the information it needed to keep pursuing this project to construction. Placerville Station 2 isn't just a park and ride project, it's what I would consider a quality of life project. Uh, the work will include significant improvements to the functional use of Mosquito Road at the US 50 on off ramp, including a dedicated right turn lane to direct travelers to Main Street and Broadway. It also includes significant improvements to the trail network. In 2019, the city was blessed with a congestion mitigation air quality funds grant to cover the cost overruns on the park and ride and the trail improvements. At the end of 2020, the city completed the lion's share of the work on Mosquito Road, except for the area at the park and ride for several key reasons. The improvements require construction of frontage to the lot and the resultant conform paving and final overlay. And there were significant pedestrian safety improvements that needed to be done as part of the project at the crossing of the Eldorado Trail located at the intersection of Clay and Mosquito. Through staff turnover, consultant buyouts, CPUC determinations and approval, extensive utility relocations, potential development, second environmental document and clearance, funding shortfalls, accelerated improvements on Mosquito Road, and a pandemic, this project has had its fair share of challenges. I've worked on a lot of FEPs for most of my career, and I can honestly say that this was one of the toughest ones I've ever seen delivered yet. Wow. Uh, this staff report does a great job of overviewing how we got here and how the bidding went with receiving three bids from Veer Camp, Martin Brothers, and Lund Construction. Veer Camp was the low bidder at one million three hundred thousand seven hundred, excuse me, one million three hundred seventy-one thousand eight hundred fifty-four and forty-eight cents, and deemed responsible and responsive. And staff is recommending award of this contract to Veer Camp. Work is anticipated to start at the soonest opportunity in their scheduling. It could be as soon as November or as late as March of next year. We're working with the contractor to get a firm date. I also wanted to highlight the staff that worked hard on this. First to Director Rivas. Pierre's help was crucial when we had to circulate the second environmental document for this project in 2018. Thank you, Pierre. And second is to Corey Schiestel. 
<laughs> of the engineering department. Corey's determination and tenacity to deliver a project like this um, is just really kind of a testimony to his character. I affectionately refer to him as king of the dead dog jobs because somehow he always finds a way to breathe life into a project and then carry the half dead body across the finish line. So thanks for all your hard work, Corey. This was definitely a win. Um, that concludes staff's report, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, thank you, Rebecca. And um, I, I'm really pleased to see this moving forward, finally, um, after all the challenges that have happened with this project. Are there any questions or comments? comments? Yeah. I don't think anybody really recognizes or understands the how much it takes to get a project like this over the finish line and it, it most of our projects in this town are not as bad as this but they have similar constraints and requirements and federal state funding and you know because we we work really hard to get uh, matching funds and grants and and competitive grants that we're constantly applying for working through edcdc for things and it's, it, it, not to mention EDTCC's efforts. I don't know if they have much effort on this particular project. They did. Yeah, um, that's what I so thought. We it went actually, through our work yeah. program. Yeah, yeah we, well, we submitted uh, the application to them in 2019 that mm -hmm. got us the CMAC funds yeah. that actually fully funded the rest of the project in terms of the park and ride and trail components. Yeah. So, and one of the actions uh, on this evening is for Measure uh, L budget appropriation, and that covers the rest of the Mosquito Road improvements. So it's going to look really, really nice in that whole area. And people are going to drive by and go, oh, look, a nice parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> Little do they know how much it takes to get this over the finish like line. So, yeah, today. right. So, so thank you. $10 million. Yep. Well, and as you mentioned in the staff report, um, it's not just the parking lot, it's the sewer infrastructure, water sewer infrastructure under Mosquito Road, trail improvements, just a whole bunch of things kind of coming together at this one spot that's going to make some real noticeable improvements to this part of town. So, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, Rebecca, thank you. Um, I, Question on the utilities of so PG&E and AT&T: Are we looking at any significant delays because of on there because of them? I know we, we've run into these issues before, especially with with, with PG&E. Are we finally like yeah, to so, the point where we can? So we actually got them moved already. <laughs> Yeah, we went through gotcha. um, some utility agreements, you know, thankfully approved by city council some time ago. And uh, they've already done their relocation work. And Everything's done. Yeah, so, and actually, originally, the uh, dreaded pole that was in the middle of the drive aisle off of Clay Street was not included. And Mr. Acuna uh, did just the lion's share of making a couple of phone calls and I said, well, you know, can they even just consider it? It would be wonderful if we could get that relocated. And he called a couple of folks and he said, well, here's an idea. And we came up with a game plan and submitted it. And they snuck in the design under the radar and did that. So, you know, and that was actually the local staff here at the pg e office. The local staff at pg e here, are, the engineers there are just phenomenal. Joe Kemp specifically was amazing. Great. Thank you. Sure. I did have one question. Sure. Can you explain um, what a bioswale sure. is? So um, any time that you pave a pervious um, area and make it impervious by, by either asphalt or concrete, you are required to have a pre and post um, you know, drainage runoff equal each other. You don't want to uh, add additional impact to the storm drain system. In addition to that, you're also uh, required to clean the water. And so this swale does both of those. Um, so it actually will clean the uh, discharge, the water, um, excuse me, the overland release uh, storm drain discharge. It directs it directly into the swale. It cleans it through the growing media, and it cleans it through the plants. And then it gets metered into the storm drain system. Okay. Thank you. Sure. That's cool. Rebecca, um, I want, on, on the map it shows five pull-through bus RV parking spaces. Yes. So um, that is not for overnight parking for RV, right? No. No. Um, the intent of having those pull-through stalls, uh, which actually was um, what we classified as bid alternative one, we're actually going to make them concrete. The intent of that was to provide a location where we could place tour buses 
Um, we don't have a very good location to do that in town. So it, it actually has kind of a couple of uses. It has the tour bus use, but it also has any kind of additional, you know, transit. Amtrak uses um, that park and ride facility as well. So it does have some some overflow parking for um, specific routes. So, but it is and I've seen parking. it here in town. Yes, when buses come in mm -hmm. um, and they drop, I, I watch <laughs> the people get off the bus so that they can, you know, enjoy the town. And yeah. then the buses have no place to go. Right. I, you know, the, I feel sorry for the drivers at times. I've watched them, but so that's a great idea. Yeah. I, I, I'm glad that you included this. This is, you know, yeah, the but um, so how? I, I guess this is going to fall then on our police department to keep people from saying, oh, <laughs> there's a spot where we can stay the night? Or well, we have, an existing, um, we have an existing ordinance in place that prevents that for that lot. Um, you know, I believe that there are some permitted parking, but, um, you know, we, we do not really allow that as it is right I, now. I know we don't, but right. I, it's just this is going to make it more visible. Right. The other thing, too, is um, the very clear lesson I have learned with any kind of development or improvements is when you bring up an area and you bring people to an area, that particular element seems to dissipate. Okay. So that, you know, we always want to develop, you know, and, and we always, not develop, but we always want to improve and build an area up, sure. make it nicer because it does, it does um, it's like the broken window theory, basically. Well, hopefully this will help Mr. Ingram. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, too. Yeah, they've been very, very patient and very good to us through all 16 years. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. All right, we'll um, open this up to the public. Tammy, once again, I'll probably forget a few things. Um, once again, the broken window is the bus station currently um, and as far as like you were saying encouraging um, people to stay overnight we already have that issue uh, this last week um, we've got three down there been down there since well, I've been gone camping most of the summer but I came back Sunday they're still there um, and it's hard for the PD because I'll tell them to move and then they go with we will and then they don't so yeah we have a homeless issue um, already and so my fear is yeah I don't want it to look I mean I'm not really well like uh, eastbound uh, fair lane park and ride that looks like an RV park and isn't that a park and ride and not overnight parking and once again the signage no one's really paying attention to that and I do believe the 11 I think the time needs to be changed and how long people can park there you know um, so okay, done with that. Um, uh, another suggestion with the uh, the phase two with the existing phase, the um, west side west side of the uh, greenbelt area, which um, is next to my house. We do our best in weed eating, you know, a certain portion of it for our own safety, fire control. Plus, I mean, I've always it's been a, the house has been in the family for 50 years. Um, but I really suggest tying that in somehow with some sort of fencing to keep the homeless out and suggest, um, you know, vegetation spraying to be further back from the fence because right now it's an orange fence um, construction and it does its best to keep the homeless out along with me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so if we could get some sort of fencing in there, I think that would be much better. Metal fencing of some sort, would anything that would look better. Look at my fence. I got green vinyl chain link fence that looks very nice. Ties in great with the bus station, but my fear is that west side um, greenbelt area next to my house, you know, needs a little more protection from visitors. Anyways, thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Sue Rodman. <coughs> Major L committee, and we have been cheering on the, the buses, the riding park, or whatever we're going to call this, and for several years, I think almost ever since the inception of the Major L committee, we have been saying, Yes, this is one that we really need to do. So I am very happy to see this go forward because it's been an eyesore for enough years, it needs to get fixed. So 
yay for Rebecca and Corey, <laughs> and yay for them for getting PG&E to actually cooperate, because that was kind of a stumbling block for a while, I know. So go, team. Thank you, Sue. Hi right, again, Ed Ingram. Well, I forgot one thing. Um, the bus station right now currently has a camera system in it right now. Has what? A camera system, safety okay. system, but it's utilized through the county itself, not primarily the city. So to get any kind of reference from it, the city has to go to the county to get pictures and whatever. So the new phase two, is the city going to, is that part of your project and going to have a camera system itself for security for those in the area and what are the limitations of usage during the day and not during the night is it going to be posted kind of a deal situation and the west side what you're referring to is a very steep high embankment of just total native native slate and from the point of the uh, northeast corner northwest corner to our property line it's just a gentle slope, and it's vegetated up to a wooded area. Is there going to be some kind of a system put in there like fencing or a concrete barrier that no one can access up into the green belt, which was typically incorporated when that first bus station was developed? A kind of a question there, so there's no access for fire or any other kind of access. But the cameras would be a good idea. And since this project is going to be put off for a bit of a time, is there a way that we can construct something that will prevent these vandalisms and individuals that come in and like playing and doing donuts in there and splattering cards with stuff, kind of prohibiting access to that area until the construction can start? Thank you. Thank you, Ed. All right, I see no one else stepping up to the podium, so I will close public comment and bring it back to the council. Um, Rebecca, there were a couple questions that came up regarding fencing. Would you like to address any of those? Uh, sure. Um, I guess I'll start first with um, the scope of work. So the scope of work for this project is focused primarily on the dirt lot. We um, have a little bit of paving over in the original phase one, um, because of the damage from the buses, but not uh, we didn't have anything planned as far as fencing or anything on that north side uh, closest to Clay Street. Um, we are aware that there is a camera system there. I believe it's actually accessed, I think, through transit. Um, and then there aren't plans to add in a camera uh, or surveillance at our lot currently. Um, as far as parking lot time frames and tightening up, I would... And, and the enforcement of that too. I would uh, defer to our police department and I would work with them on if there's anything that needs to be revised as far as the parking code do, goes to. Um, let's see. I think that covered majority of the questions. Uh, oh, constructing something, pre uh, preventing vandalism until the construction starts. Um, we hadn't anticipated that. Uh, once this contract actually gets awarded, it actually goes under um, the... I guess the oversight of the contractor. So at that point, they decide when they start physically taking control of the site. Um, but we, at the, you know, at that point, we're the landowner. We could direct them to do something, uh, but just be aware it would be a change order. Okay, thank you. Sure. And Chief Friend, do you have anything to add in regards to enforcement of this area or? Yes, there's no, um, there's currently no overnight camping permitted in any of the parking lots, so we can take care of that. Um, if a vehicle's parked unoccupied in the lot, then there are certain provisions of our ordinance in the vehicle code where we can notice the vehicle requiring it to move within a specified period of time. If not, it'd be subject to towing. That's if the signage is, is correct, and we can definitely check on that. Okay, thank you. All right. Would anyone can, can I can I just add? Rebecca's correct. The the cameras are controlled by transit. They monitor those. I know that they they tried to give us access to them. Joe, can you comment? I, I don't remember what 
it was a different format or something, so we had a hard time making it work for us. Yeah, work. two different systems, and they yeah. weren't talking to each other. It would require an upgrade on our part, and we just didn't have, at that time, the funding to to look at that. And they, we don't necessarily sit, have somebody sitting staring at the cameras anyway. Mm -hmm. So as long as we know that there's an ability to record an incident or an event, we can always go back and, and pull that recording for evidentiary purposes. And I think so, transit does have that ability, so we can. And we've we I've been in and inspected their system before, and it's it's a very very good system. Right, it just doesn't. They used a different vendor um, than right, and mm -hmm. it just didn't. Interesting. Yeah. And unfortunately, I'm fairly certain that nobody's there watching them at transit either in the middle of the right. night. They, so yeah, I don't, it's not really no, a preventative, yeah, quick response type of surveillance. It, it's more of an after after the fact, yeah. Okay. You know, if we had a, if we had a, you know, I, not necessarily a, you know, a multiple um, view system, but if we had an overall mm -hmm. of the the transit facility at night, so we can see people walking into it or, yeah. or see cars driving into it, that would be that would be doable. But as it stands now, between the parking garage and the downtown camera system, I mean, we're talking thirty cameras that one dispatcher views so um, there are times when when they do get lucky and catch somebody but if they're uh, if they're busy it's just uh, it's it's we utilize that for the documentation of, a, of an incident to be used for investigative purposes okay well it sounds like it that may be something worth looking at in future budget considerations for it probably would be good to have eyes on our parking rides especially if there's well, you know, um, maybe working with continual transit. problems, but hopefully also, or adding a city camera. But but, but um, work with transit, maybe they would have access to getting money more yeah, so than we true. would. You know, mm -hmm. um, but also hopefully, you know, the improvements at this location will um, deter and prevent. That's what I'm a lot hoping. Of, yeah, a lot of issues. So, um, okay, we then I would entertain a motion if. Anyone I'd like to make a motion that we uh, approve the three items that, as as uh, explained in our agenda. A second. All right, we have a first and a second. Regina, can we get a roll call, please? Councilmember Borelli. Aye. Councilmember No. Aye. Councilmember Thomas. Aye. Vice Mayor Saragossa. Aye. Mayor Taylor. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next item is 12.4. And this is to approve a change order on the contract for the town hall um, equipment. And Mr. Zeller has the support, I believe. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as you recall, staff had worked with Creation Networks in Incorporated to establish a cost for a base upgrade to uh, this chambers, which consisted of two cameras, three wireless microphones, and three TV monitors for the council and the audience. And it was determined when going through that uh, project that two more cameras, two more microphones, and two more TV monitors would best serve the needs for meetings and emergency operations use. And that request for a new project total was received prior to the September 13th meeting, and uh, it was awarded at $61,452.87. Um, there was a miscommunication between uh, staff and the vendor on the additional equipment and those errors were not discovered until a post award review of the itemized proposal uh, and it uh, turned out that uh, the two cameras and two additional TV monitors were not in the new project total and so staff is requesting that the cost of these um, and the associated materials and labor be awarded as a change order in the amount of twelve thousand four forty one and fifty cents um, it pretty much came out to around 10,000 in missed equipment and another 2,400 in additional labor to install it. Um, and so um, as far as the funding element goes, um, we're looking at requesting approval for $7,409 additional appropriation from ARPA funding and the other 5,000 or so coming from general fund contingency and undesignated fund balance for the project. Um, it, the specs were fairly technical and I thought I was counting uh, the right um, products, but it turned out to be associated um, transmission equipment. And so that was, that was my mistake. And so uh, 
brought this back to the council to see if we can get that additional funding in place and move forward with the project. And I can take any questions. All right. Thank you. Terry, any questions? Um, I did. I didn't see in any of this paperwork any kind of warranty that we're going to get. We're buying all this new fancy equipment and new screens. Do we, I was just wondering what kind of warranty we get with this. Uh, we have a larger proposal that was um, part of the um, original um, submittal in September, and that covers the training, the warranty on the equipment, and all the other associated information, and I can get that to the council. But we do have a warranty. I mean, it is. Yes, a warranty is part of the part of the package. Do you know if it's like a 30-day or a three-year? <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's a one-year warranty. Okay, on the equipment? On the equipment. Okay. And we also have the, um, the, the, one of the reasons we chose Creation Networks is because they have done work in the area and became highly recommended. Um, the... Uh, um, Tahoe Community College put in a lot of work and they had a lot of um, training that needed to be done and a lot of upgrades and small things and uh, this this vendor was very flexible with that and so I think they're gonna serve our needs well now that we've got the uh, the hard costs hammered out all right thank you any other questions comments nope Okay. Um, I've got, <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. <laughs> I've got to say, I, this this item gives me a little bit of heartburn because <laughs> it just seems like so much money for you know the fifty people that maybe watch our meetings between in person and online. And when I when we had originally talked about. ARPA funding going to town hall improvements. I had other improvements. It's kind of like higher priority than TVs and cameras. But that being said, you know, our our timer doesn't work. Our camera, our yellow screen, yellow screen our microphone was cutting out on people, which all um, highlights the need for this. It just it seems like a lot. And it, I don't want to spend any more than this. Than, this change so order done done okay. <laughs> you know i tell you though when you go to other cities um and you attend their meeting we are so antiquated we i are. mean it's embarrassing <laughs> we, we we really have to do something <laughs> yeah well and and unfortunately nowadays you know it's costly uh, we could have done it a few years ago we, we've been talking about this for years mm -hmm. of trying to do something with this whole situation yeah. and it just hasn't it's been a low priority uh, but we really need to set the bar higher. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's just, I mean, if you watch this from home, you can't see any of the presentations. You can't see any of the information. <laughs> and we really should be able to provide this to the public um, so that they can participate and, and look up and see what's going on. I mean, it's kind of a barrier for information for me. And yeah, I'm thinking yeah. in the future, there might be other uses that are going to come up too, you know, where we'll be able to utilize well, it does reference the EOC, so hopefully, um, should we need an EOC, yeah. that this system will serve it well. Um, I really don't think that we have utilized it as much, perhaps, as we mm -hmm. really, you know, to, to give, maybe there's something really important going on in the city, and, you know, we could call a special, you know, we have our, we call meetings for down here, but a lot of people can't get to us. Mm -hmm. But if they had a reason for turning on, you know, Channel 2 or... Uh, they could view it and yeah so. anyway and, and if it was less painful to watch than yeah. it currently yeah. is where it's like what <laughs> who's talking so yep. yeah I mean it, it is necessary it just seems like a lot but I don't want I don't want any more <laughs> it's 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 an important investment and I it, even even to make sure we get it done right I, I appreciate you know Terry having to come back and and uh, ask for a little more but I think it's important that we get it done right and we do it yeah. the yeah. first time or the second time but it's the first time in 40 years so it's yeah the first time so it's overdue <laughs> technology has changed yeah. a lot in 40 years too <laughs> yeah. um all right i'll open this up to the public 12.4 right? so robin one more time um i think that we're forgetting that we're also looking at an emergency operations center for here, and that could be highly critical. The Caldor fire, other fires, 
We've had people who were evacuated who came here. We need to have an ability to support those emergency operations. And right now we don't have it. So I think that's, that's something, it's not just for town hall meetings. It's not just for city council meetings. I think we need to remember that it's also to give us a basis for the emergency operations. Thank you, Sue. All right, seeing no one else from the public stepping up to the podium, I will close public comment on 12.4 and bring it back to the council. I'll make a motion to adopt the resolution. Second. All right. We have a first and a second. Can we get a roll call? Councilmember Borelli? Aye. Councilmember No? Aye. Councilmember Thomas? Aye. Vice Mayor Saragossa? Aye. Mayor Taylor? Aye. All right. Um, item 12.5. This is acknowledge and file the ARPA budget status report um, and provide direction to staff. And City Manager Morris has this report. Actually, Dave. Oh, sorry, Dave. <laughs> Not a problem. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the Council. Um, as you may recall, on March 11, 2021, President Biden uh, signed the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, to assist the country in recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the Act provides funding for state, local, and tribal governments including $65 billion for cities nationwide. Since that time, the city has received a total of $2,673,298 in ARPA funding. Uh, ARPA funds must be encumbered or committed by the end of 2024 and expended, meaning cash paid, uh, by the end of 2026. <clears throat> At your meeting held on uh, September 27th, the council requested a status update on the ARPA budget and its associated uses, which staff will present tonight, uh, including in your budget action in the previous agenda item, uh, the uh, total ARPA budgets, $2,173,298, uh, have been budgeted for specific purposes at this time. I'd like to quickly review the, uh, uh, I call it the pumpkin bar spreadsheet uh, that has all the budget items on it. Um, so starting at up top, you have the uh, uh, four by four pickup truck, number one, all the way down to number three, the uh, two Ford interceptors. That has all been spent. Um, the number four fuel reduction treatment for city property, uh, we've encumbered all but $196,000. And we'd like to talk about perhaps using that $196,000 for other things. Uh, number five, the Lions Park Large Shelter has not been encumbered and uh, staff would actually like some time to approach the Lions Club to see if they'd be interested in funding that project. That could potentially free up that $63,000. The uh, Town Hall Emergency Operations, you just discussed that entire $64,000 has been encumbered. Uh, the pool filter sand replacement, we still want to do that, but however, it hasn't been encumbered yet. Um, the GIS software training, that's been enc encumbered and spent. Uh, the corporation yard revitalization, very important project, hasn't been encumbered, but we just want to leave it there for that project, as well as the number 10 public safety building. Uh, again, that project's in process. We haven't utilized that uh, 250 yet, but we plan on doing that, so. Uh, number 11, citywide marketing program. The chamber's uh, off and running with that. That's been spent or encumbered uh, entirely. The uh, computer equipment replacement, 54,000, that's been, for the most part, completely encumbered. Um, the sewer water bill as assistance program, um, we actually, <clears throat> because of the uh, sewer and water arrearages program we were able to do and provide some of our residents some real relief, as well as the low-income um, household water assistance program, which is still active, we felt that perhaps the council should consider utilizing those funds for something else because there's a lot of resources for our customers already. Uh, number 14, the broadband master plan, that's underway, uh, fully encumbered. The one-time distribution, number 15, uh, was paid to city employees. The uh, 16 historic city hall roof project, 98,000. Um, 
there's obviously a need there, and matter of fact, we're probably going to recommend that that be liquidated partially to pay for some improvements at 525 Main Street um, due to the red tagging of the old city hall, historic city hall. So, and then um, 17, the senior management analyst position, that is an active recruitment. Uh, we don't, we are pursuing grant funds, but for right now, uh, we would like to keep that there. The contribution to Eldorado County on page two, number 18. The 287500 that was originally for the Perks Court uh, proposal, which uh, didn't happen, but fortunately the Fair Lane project did. Um, however, at this time, it doesn't sound like the county has a need for that funding, so uh, it is not, there's an opportunity to liquidate that and use it for other things. And then 19, the broadband conduit, that was fully spent, $30,000. So again, right now, um, and that uh, number 23 you just budgeted, for uh, to finish the uh, emergency uh, town hall improvements. So um, that leaves the 500000 for a corporation yard, which hasn't been budgeted, but again, that's an important project. We don't recommend touching that. But if you add up line, not, excuse me, line item 4, 5, 13, and 18, which at this time we feel potentially we could liquidate those for other purposes, that gives you $596,839. Um, that uh, <clears throat> you could um, use for other things like uh, broadband, homeless programs, beautification, additional safety improvements to town hall. I know that was mentioned earlier, uh, and needed repairs to the downtown public restroom. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or if the council would like to provide direction on the use of those funds. Thank you. Can I'm sorry. Go, go, ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. no, you're, no, you're, no. It's after, your meeting. After you. okay. Can we? Um, thank you. Can we allocate these? Reallocate these funds tonight, if we chose to. Um, I, I probably wouldn't recommend it because it wasn't specifically um, agendized that mm -hmm. way. I would recommend you could give us direction, and we could bring that back for the specific allocations. Thank you. That's my only question at this moment. I have a question. Uh, when you, go ahead. You're first. You go ahead. I've got some comments. Oh, you're so good. Okay. I've got okay. comments. She's got um, a lot of I, Dave, I wanted to ask you about the the funds that we originally were going to give to the county for the navigation center, and you said you hadn't heard anything. Uh, when are we going to hear something? Mr. Morris has had conversations with the county. Right. You I have talked to uh, Mr. Ashton, the CAO for the county his comment was that they do not anticipate needing those funds he said that they specifically are setting aside some of their arpa funds just in case but at this point their initial estimates they do not anticipate needing additional funding that uh, the grant funding they've received for homeless should cover those amounts right, so, since you since that topic is up on the table right now i would like to consider using some of those funds or in the, for a future date for uh, w a winter shelter program to get, you know, what, what, to see what there might be some need for a winter shelter through the end of this year until that other shelter comes up. All right. Um, thank you, Dave, for that staff report. I had requested for this item to come forward because, you know, when, when we were considering how to spend, um, this windfall of, of money. <laughs> um, what I really did not want to do was just kind of pick away at it willy-nilly without having, you know, some strategy behind it. And it seems like with the remaining, we've had lots of agenda items coming forward with ARPA um, asks lately. So I just wanted to kind of like regroup, take a look at what we now have available um, and make sure that we're just kind of being strategic about how we use these funds. Um, so I really want to have a discussion about what we want to and well, use What's the, the de deadline for the decision for using this funding? We have to encumber it by the end of 2014 and 20, spend it by 24. the... Uh, 24. 24 and spend it by the end of 26. Correct. Yeah. Spend it by what? The end of what? 26. Mm -hmm. Okay. So some... Um, some things that I think are important that I would like to suggest if the council agrees to kind of put as like guardrails on what the money can be spent on is town hall safety improvements um, or lay out 
you know, town hall improvements other than the equipment for um, video and audio, the broadband project, homelessness and encampment cleanup and or encampment cleanup, um, beautification projects around town that will be noticeable by the whole community and vegetation management are kind of my top priorities. And I wanted to check in with the council and see how you feel about that. And that's fine. I just want to be sure that we that money stays in there for the corporation yard. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. just an absolute must. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah. Well, first, I didn't want to spend that 196 until we actually get that done. Um, mm -hmm. We're not moving forward getting everything done the way we thought it was going to get done so it may end up costing us more i don't okay. want to take away our That's fire protection point. until we are actually there mm -hmm. um so that that was which one, one jackie um number four I'm, I'm in agreement with you on that and not only this year but you know going into next year to do some maintenance work and see what that looks like because we really haven't allocated funds and so to keep this mm -hmm. over to a second year and help us get established on what an annual <clears throat> work project is going to look like. Just just a reminder, if I recall right, we did allocate $50,000 towards that for next year. Is that right, Dave? For the vegetation general fund. management and right. out of a general fund. Correct. For that for that maintenance purpose. Mm -hmm. So there is some funding that we yeah, I, and I, but I like hanging on to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. In the I, next I, year. I know one's ever, everyone's optimistic. We have these contracts, but they haven't moved forward mm -hmm. as expected and as promised so far. So I just want to hold back and, and make sure we get our fuel reduction Fully first understand. before we yep. Yep. move that money elsewhere. So if we don't reallocate that, it brings our our workable capital down to four hundred, about four hundred thousand. I thought it was closer to three hundred, but five ninety minus. Okay. 196 I 590 I had 533 when we added them up that's correct about 400,000 okay but anyways I mean I'm hearing new items town hall safety beautification projects these are all things that we hadn't really talked about earlier so I'm a little uncomfortable or let's say I have projects yeah I'd like to put on the table well, that's what, that's what you know the um, discussions about I know that some people think our parks and recs are in in fairly good shape and and there's some things that really aren't in good shape mm -hmm. um, you know I would I always think to look at those but honestly you know we're just picking away at broadband um, so every every little project we put here we're saying we're kind of throwing broadband out the window so I would you know we don't have to allocate all these mm -hmm. till 2024 I'd like to give us a little more time to see a how these fundings actually play out are we gonna have as much as we think we are um, and a little bit more detailed discussion about you know how important is it that we move forward with broadband because I think we all can put projects out there and broadband could just disappear <laughs> and how much are we going to need you know for matching fundings and that may take a little bit of time too to see you know what do we actually need are we going to get grants and, and things like that so it's just kind of my initial thoughts with broadband I agree and I think that broadband is a really important project that we definitely want to stay committed to the only thing with that one is that there is a lot of other funding sources available for you know infrastructure dollars and things like that available for broadband so um, my only concern is that we might need matching right. funds for yeah. that. So, you know, if we hold back and, you know, we might be able to quadruple our money by having ma matching funds, I'd just like to see us, you know, bef I, I don't want to allocate this all tonight. I kind of want to yeah, give yeah. ourselves the opportunity to maximize our dollars moving forward. Mm -hmm. So, I, I'm, when I came into this, uh, the only thing that was really critical for me is the fuel reduction. And the rest of it, I was thinking, we just need to take a pause. Um, regroup find out what it is and then and then maybe this might be an opportunity for a, a special meeting or a different meeting where we just you know kind of reevaluate where all where we're at on all these and, and bring it back around again I don't know of any projects right now that are time sensitive that are pressing except for maybe one that you're thinking well, of right now well, you mentioned the winter shelter but yes that that is one but then there's the other you know we we have money set aside in projects that we perhaps don't want to tie up with those projects so that's like another thing that I want to look at you know do we want to keep money allocated in the Lions Park shelter do we want to keep money allocated in the um, 
the sewer and water bill sewer assistance water, right. program. Yeah. You know, right now it's sitting there. We don't really need it there because there is so much other um, funding available for that. So that's another thing that so okay. I think we need what, to what can we do? Tonight. I think just all I would provide, say provide tonight, direction. If you want to provide, yeah. provide okay. direction, then okay. we can bring yeah. back formal action for you at your next meeting. Okay. Okay. I wouldn't. Just to answer Kara's question about you're asking about the sixty-three thousand, the fifty thousand, I'm okay mm -hmm. with liquidating both of mm -hmm. those because I think we do have higher priorities. We mm -hmm. have bathrooms that need to be fixed. You know, I, I would like us to you know reprioritize some of those things and look at our highest priorities in the city. Mm -hmm. I mean, shelters are great, but you know they're. I, I can tell you at Lions Park, the upper bathroom. Right. You know. Well, the downtown bathroom. Downtown yeah. bathroom yeah, is, is another really, example. Yeah. yeah. That's in, yeah. Oof. So, well, and that's something that, um, you know, in terms of like beautification, I kind of had in mind fixing things like bathrooms in our parks and stuff like that. So, do we want to provide direction to staff to put some of that money into the bathroom repairs? Because it is it's pretty bad in the downtown one. Um, you know, we're going into the Christmas shopping season, and it probably needs some work. Probably won't get done by then. Well, yeah. you know, it's just like I was, as you all know, that was my husband's project. <laughs> um, and he did it all with donations. Mm -hmm. And so it really um, bless all their hearts and everything. They, they, I mean, it, you know, it was great, but it wasn't perfect. I'm going to say professionally planned out and stuff. And I know now that there's a lot of um, technology and stuff that that's out there for bathrooms. I mean, they're putting bathrooms mm -hmm. down on sidewalks that, you know, $50,000 for just a, you know. But I, I think that we are going to need money for that. It, it can't be just a, a few hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's got to really be done correctly. Well, um, you know. There's some evaluation that needs to be done there. Well, and I think we also need to evaluate all our van our bathrooms keep getting vandalized. I don't want right. to put a whole bunch of money into a bathroom that's just going to be torn apart in the next year. What are we going to do to prevent that vandalism mm -hmm. from happening mm -hmm. again in these prime locations? Yes, yeah. so, and that's why I think staff will need some time to, to look at what the best options are. But I do agree. I think the deferred maintenance, um, there's always that list mm -hmm. of deferred maintenance that some of those dollars could go to... Um, fixing or at least getting our deferred maintenance um, called back a little bit. So I'm in favor of that. The other thought I had was with the sewer and water bill assistance program, and this doesn't have to be the full amount, but taking some of those dollars to continue providing our residents with the ability to do some fuel reduction at their location so mm. um, so that we would have that fund still there. I know we, we allocated some fund to the fire council, but um, you know, just like people couldn't pay for their water bills, people are still having a hard time paying for those fuel reductions because we know it's a lot. So to the extent that we could get private lots still cleaned mm -hmm. up uh, is maybe, you know, dedicating some funds. That's a, that's a good that thought, Michael. Well. I, didn't think I do that. really like that, um, that idea. And we've talked about the ability to provide funds to private properties to do improvements. And there's been, you know, it's like, is it a gift of public funds? But then... I also know that ARPA is a little bit more flexible with things like that in terms of assistance. So do you know if we could legally do that? Because I think, I think it's needed. I think, I think we can. Also, anytime you can articulate a public benefit, even if it's going to a private entity or person, it would not be construed as a gift to public funds. So that would be okay. possible. Well, would that be something that perhaps you'd want to consider giving additional funds to the uh, Fire Safe Council That's to continue thinking. their program. It would just it, be the same as what we've done already and just allocate additional funds. But That's what I thought because it would be less staff work for us to have to deal with, you know, to, to, yeah. to have a step-up program, uh, but that we would just go through the Fire Safe mm -hmm. Council to allocate more funds because it sounds like, I mean, thank you for the update today, and it sounds like the, it's needed, and if you had the dollars, you mm -hmm. could probably do more. And even like Sue showed in the program, we can't fund the entire, you know, but it, it, every little bit helps and mm -hmm. it, it encourages people to step forward and say, okay, they did this, so I'll, mm -hmm. you know, match it and do. I, I, want, I, w I would like to have some guardrails on that because I could see people who are more affluent. Absolutely. And, and in the know, take advantage mm -hmm. of a program like that when they could easily do it themselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to see the actually helping people that need help. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. Um, 
And then what about the homelessness navigation center money? Obviously, the county apparently does not need this. This was mm -hmm. for something very specific um, that is no longer on the table. I do still think that there's a big need for things like encampment cleanup. Oh, um, definitely. So I don't want to. I don't want to completely just take those funds out of um, use for that type of activity and just put it in some well, look what it's cost us already just to clear out camps you know and um, I mean it's very expensive um, so I, I think that's a great idea how do you how do you want to park it well I think we should provide direction to staff to say you know set aside X amount of dollars for Community cleanup, or yeah. Well, I don't. I mean, maybe you should ask staff to kind of mm -hmm. look at some of those costs and come back with recommendations for the the residual ARPA funds. Because you know, that, we've that, all mentioned some things, and, mm -hmm. and have you know our department heads yeah. like they mm -hmm. did in the first time. You know, give us the high priorities and and kind of um, now that mm -hmm. they've heard everything we have to say, kind of yeah. That's kind of what I was yeah. thinking too. Is you know we've kind of provided some thoughts and direction, but. The numbers. I would be hesitant to put a a dollar amount on any, on on any of these yet. Just to yeah, I, I want to look at a whole list. You yeah, know, I want to prioritize, and we've just thrown out a lot of things and a lot of thoughts. Mm -hmm. And um, our, I think our our staff should be weighing in on all that also. Dave or Chief Friend, do you have any just ballpark ideas on how much it's going to cost to clean up the Broadway camp? <laughs> Terry. Okay. Or public works and facilities. I, I don't. I don't think we have any okay. estimated costs. It's not. Well, I'm be remembering cheap. that one was sixty thousand dollars down here, and another one was forty thousand. I mean, so it's you know. And we're it looking depends. At, you know, we've gotten we've been successful in having volunteer. We, we've work done. Over the we've last done a better years. job going forward with that, and I think yeah. we can do it for less. But okay. there is going to be some cost mm -hmm. involved with it. Yeah. Okay. Um. It's, you know, it's another almost thing like we park this for, except for maybe a few exceptions, because there's no needs until first part of even the first part of next year, mm -hmm. and reevaluate because then those things will start uh, revealing themselves as some of those needs there. Uh, we'll have some time to think about it. Um, I don't see. I mean, the winter's coming, so I don't see a lot of any of these things really critical, and it gives the staff because I don't want to, you know. Can I can I mention one thing about broadband? Yes. <laughs> yes. My, okay. my pet, my pet, pet project. Yes. Say that. Um, there is a grant, and Michael, you're familiar with it. Green means go. Uh, that we plan on submitting a, uh, an application for. Uh, it does not require a match, but it has language in there that suggests a match would increase your likelihood of being oh, really? funded. The SACOG. Uh, yeah, through SACOG. Yeah. Um, we're working on that right now. Um, it, it's an interesting one because it needs, it has to be, uh, and I plan on bringing this back to you. On, it's due on the 27th of this month. I plan on bringing <laughs> it back to you on the 25th. So I, I just thought I'd complicate matters more for you. Oh, good. <laughs> um, but, I mean, if we decide we're not, we're not ready to make that commitment of, of ARPA funds, I, I understand that. But I, I, I do want to present that to you. I'll present the application and get approval for you to uh, give me approval to move forward with it and then whether or not it has uh, matching funds in it we, we can move forward mm -hmm. with you still working on the dollar amount for that I'm and, and the project that we're looking at just so you know this has to be associated uh, well it has to be within our, our green zone that we've established which is the Broadway mm -hmm. corridor it also has to be related to uh, creating additional housing so we're working on that, that connection, and we think we can do it because we've already, we're in the middle of a study through the Civic Lab, pro, lab Project to look at how we can create mixed-use housing on that, in on that Broadway. zone mm -hmm. on Broadway. Infilling. So I think there is definitely that connection. Adding high-speed internet can improve our business and our residential uh, as a need up there. So that's the connection. So the project I'm looking at is kind of what we've, we've started for our pilot project, but it would take... Uh, the internet from our central location on Main Street that we've established all the way up to Broadway and then all the way up Broadway and, and make that available, put the full service in, making it available to all businesses and residential on, on Broadway. So that's the potential project that we're, we're working on in terms of uh, submitting. So 
I'll just throw it out for you to think about. I, I will bring the application back whether or not you decide to add uh, any funds to that to, for matching funds. Uh, that's up to you. And, and, and I'm fine either way because I understand this is we don't have all the answers for, for mm -hmm. this. And, and there will be other opportunities. There's other grants uh, that we are working on. Uh, we're, we're very hopeful that the the LATA grant, uh, which is a um, planning grant that we've applied for, for $499,000. We've had good conversations back and forth with the state on that. And, I'm, and what's that grant? That's, it's, LATA is Local Agency Technical Assistance Grant. And? And it'll be f towards broadband also. Oh, that, okay. But it's, but it's only planning. It, it can't go towards construction. Oh, oh, oh. The Green Means Go grant would go towards construction. You know, of we the talk system. about so so much that I can't remember <laughs> yeah, the, from I one, one grant yeah. to another. So I, 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 I'll, I'll I echo do. Cleve's uh, you know thoughts here, and that I, I do think we have a really good opportunity with the SACOG grant. Uh, I think we're in a, we would be in a good position. I think, especially with being participants in Civic Lab and it being you know one of one of the examples that was put out there already. So you know, if we do want to do that, there's obviously no guarantees of us getting the, the grant, but I do think we'd be in a good position. And if we did allocate some additional funding um, as match, you know, it, it would increase our, our scores, you know, that much more. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. something to think about. Well, I think we should put something towards it. I mean, I, that's, we, we said it was, this was on our original list. I don't think we should ax it out for a bunch of other things unless we have really high priority things. So, and, you know, like you said, sometimes, Maybe it's not as much as we want to put, but putting something towards mm -hmm. matching can really help an application. So um, do you have any idea, Cleve? Are, are you looking at, like, a hundred grand? <laughs> I, my estimate was somewhere between two and five, actually, but I would settle okay. for two. I anticipate this is going to be close to a $2 million project. Wow. So if, if we had a 10% match of $200,000, I think that's, that's something. Okay, so. and when would we find out if yeah. we were awarded the grant? Um, I don't remember if they've said when those would be awarded. Uh, Michael, do you remember? Early 2023. I was going to say it's not until okay. after the first of the year. Yeah. So if we did not receive the grant, we would have time to utilize the money. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You, you could pull Absolutely. that back okay. and okay. put it for something else. Yes, yeah. Okay, so. David has something. Oh, sorry. Go. Oh. Do you have something you want to add? If I may, Mayor, um, sure. kind of going back to the uh, discussion about city council discretion of the money, um, when the final guidelines came out for the American Rescue Plan, there was an option for a $10 million ex exemption um, that basically allows every dollar under $10 million to be considered revenue loss, and we took that option. Mm -hmm. What that means is, is that the money is now very discretionary. So you can decide pretty much. Yeah. It would be like, kind of like your general fund. I mean, it is federal funds, but you have more discretion in what you can use those funds for. Okay. I didn't realize that the entire amount was. I thought was. that. That was kind of a late-breaking thing. It was, it, was, it was a later change that they okay. made to the guidelines that uh, allowed us to do that, which okay. made it much more flexible. Yeah. Um, well, that's good. I still think it should be used on things <laughs> that, you know, are really <laughs> visible to the community sure. <laughs> and make make things better um, in everyday life. Um, so in terms of direction to staff, I would propose liquidating item five, the Lions Park Shelter, and item 13, the sewer and water bill assistance, and item 18, um, the navigation center. Was there anything else? I think that's everything that we talked about. Leaving the 196 in vegetation management um, and coming back at the next meeting with some suggestions or estimates in terms of the broadband, which you plan on bringing back anyways. Yeah. This is the difficult thing. We'll, we'll be able to bring that back. Um, I'll, have, I'll have, you know, the application and, and give you that option to consider something there. These other items in terms of getting quotes on some mm -hmm. of like the bathrooms and things, those may take a little bit okay. more time than bring it back at the next meeting. So, um, but we will work on it, work towards that. Okay. So, and, um, so we don't want to. We, Dennis would like to consider money for the. Well, I think. Center, yeah. I, I think with, with what we're doing here, however the winter shelter comes up and whatever the needs are, we can, re, we can consider it and, uh, and look at a 
the source of the money at the time. I don't know that it has to be ARPA. And at the time that we, if if it, if and when it comes forward, we could evaluate the source at that time. I imagine. Is that seems that, like it would be a time sensitive. It would be, but but I I know that there's an ask out there, and but I but I don't, and I have some numbers, but I'm not ready to just. There's out a what there? out there? An ask. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Well, so I, I've been contacted by House in El Dorado mm -hmm. a couple of times, but they yeah. they referred it not to as a as a winter shelter. They've asked me about um, a shelter to be used during inclement weather, which is a completely different thing to me. That's mm -hmm. only if we have, you know, that sub freezing sub freezing weather and, yeah. and snowstorms and stuff like that. So um, so anyway, I have had some yeah. contact with them regarding that. So. So we could just leave that hanging. It doesn't need to. I mean, we could, we could, we could look at all different types of funding for it. So not okay. that many. And but do we few. want to, do we want to, um, for the remaining approximately $400,000, do we want to stipulate for deferred maintenance, kind of community improvement projects, homeless encampments, broadband, vegetation maintenance, or... My, my concern and the reason why I brought this forward is because I feel like if you don't, mm -hmm. um, then any time the city needs a piece of equipment, you know, or no offense, <laughs> but yeah. that's just going to be where, right. you know, I mean, that's that's why I brought it forward is to yeah. make sure that it's being used for what we want it to be used uh, for. Can, uh, can I suggest that we, we bring those back to you at the next meeting as part of that agenda item and you can... You can, you bring, know, approve bring those. What, bring bring what back? Those four categories that you just what named. Just to, to pull them. To well, the, I, you the know, future, I don't, future, future money would be. You know, we really haven't spent much that. time having that discussion. I don't know. I think I'd rather just lock the money. Well, lock the money. I've just set it aside for now and, and know that other than the broadband, that money is going to be set aside for a future conversation. And just say nobody can that's, touch that's this. Fine. This is ours. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> and I like those, but, but, I, but I'd rather set it aside for a future conversation okay. rather and than... But, but then look put, at it as all together instead of just chipping it. Exactly. Because that's my concern. Right. Is yes. that it's just right. Get and, and, away, and then, you know? Because I don't want to put guardrails on it today and okay. then have to redo that again. I think it's a deeper conversation than just this right now. Okay, so are we saying, okay, we have 400000 we just liquidated, if, you know, to move forward. Are we saying we want to put $200,000 to the broadband project matching and then the 200000 we want to hold, or are we holding all 400000 because we'll, we're going to we'll have to? We'll like consider that at the next meeting. Yeah, okay. I thought it was, we're not so, allocating okay. anything. Now. Wasn't it 600000 uh, no. broadband, it, I guess. It could potentially be 600000 if we end up liquidating the uh, fuel reduction if we don't use that. Oh, gotcha. But, yeah, but yeah. we had said we wanted to hold yeah. on to that okay. for right now until we're sure that that happens. Yep, thanks for that reminder. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, so we'll li liquidate those items. We'll consider the broadband amount at the next meeting, mm -hmm. and then the rest will be held held in until a list of projects comes back for it that okay. can be looked at together instead of moving away. If, if I may, Mayor. Yes. Could we uh, just receive direction from the council and then bring those items forward? I'm just concerned about. Um, Actions being taken without it being agendized, and because these are federal funds, single audit. It's, right. It needs right. To be that, that so this we're is not making a motion. This we're is not making this a motion. motion. Right. Oh, yeah. Just direction. direction to staff. Yeah. 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 I was just very specific. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> specific yeah. direction. I'd like yeah. to move that. No. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. We'll open this item up to the public. If anyone would like to comment on it. <laughs> As a resident, um, so I think uh, certainly having money available for broadband, I know that sort of bucket is currently empty, um, is super important. So when we have some of these funds liquidated, I would agree with that. And then having that available for things like matching funds on the project, it sounds like will come before the council. I think you know getting that in. Um, I know I've been a big advocate of mixed use development, uh, particularly in that Broadway corridor. So anything we can do to help drive that, which I think broadband internet would help with, would be great. Um, I agree with keeping our fuel reduction. I think vegetation management is super important um, until we're absolutely confident we don't need it. And also with looking at providing some more funding to the Fire Safe Council uh, to allow private owners who cannot 
um, you know, pay for or do the physical labor themselves to have a means to kind of help with that. Um, you know, I know a lot of folks, they're, they're, I mean, I have neighbors who, you know, aren't necessarily the greatest on vegetation management and they're retired folks and I don't want to like be on their case, but it also makes me super nervous <laughs> with my property. There's only so much I can do alone um, and I can volunteer to help them, but that's about kind of as far as it goes. So uh, I think that having sort of programs for that, but we would want to make sure that like, you know, clearly I can afford to maintain my own property. So I would want to make sure that like the folks that are getting that service are ones who really just can't do it um, on their own. So that's my comments. Thanks. Thank you, Nicole. So Rodman, Fire Safe Council, so you know I'm going to vote that we keep some money in there for vegetation management, more than just the $50,000 per year. Um, it's expensive work to do. And as far as the Fire Safe Council doing for people, the, the last set of slides I showed you was a person who is not able to do theirs. And so their grant actually is $1,500. It was the largest one we put out this year. And it's an, a, a, uh, an older disabled person and their older disabled brother who lives with them too. And they could not do this work on their own. So that was the reason that we went ahead and, and uh, did, their, did a larger grant for them. And this will not complete their work, but it does a pretty good job of getting them started. And um, I think that you know, there are quite a few people out there still who would like to get an evaluation, and some of those are elderly and low income and need some help. And people, a lot of those are people with very large trees. And if you've taken a chainsaw in your hands and then looked at some tree that's 60, 70 feet tall and thought about it, you're not going to do that yourself. It's got to be. You've got to have help with those. A weed eater I can handle, but I'm not going to tackle an 80 foot tree. I uh, had help to do the two big trees that I did this year. So, uh, and also I'd like to support Councilmember Thomas's idea of doing a winter shelter. We heard that the 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 community is not prepared to do a winter shell this year, this year. They, I think, were counting on the county to come through and have something in place. And the, the part that we did last year with the, up on, on uh, Main Street there, the old DA's office, I think, was very well done. It worked and people supported it and there, I didn't hear anybody say that it was terrible or they had any bad experiences there so I'd like to encourage us to go ahead and do that thank you thank you Sue all right I see no one else uh, stepping up to the podium so we will bring it back um, and move on to so you, so you, you everyone set with direction yep. yeah okay. Okay. <laughs> just just one one thing for consideration she brought up the issue of the winter shelter mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I, I got to be careful with this, and I don't want to necessarily overcommit either, because the idea of the navigation center is that it is not a winter shelter, mm -hmm. right. is that it is a navigation center and trans for transitional and people working on getting out of homelessness. So the idea, I, I, I might have misspoke a little bit in the idea that says, well, this will get us until the shelter, the, the uh, Navigation Center opens, but I don't know that that's a, a fair statement either. So I just needed to correct okay. that a little bit. All right. Okay, so item 13, council reports from other agency meetings, and we'll start with El Dorado Transit Authority. All right, we approved a revised salary schedule. We're kicking off the MyRide program, uh, which is a mileage reimbursement program for seniors, veterans, and disabled residents where you have to sign up through Eldorado Transit, but then 
those people can have neighbors or friends, you know, give them a ride and then be reimbursed just to try to expand the transit program. So you can look that up on the website. Mm -hmm. um, the local passes uh, for the fall are on sale at El Dorado Transit, and El Dorado Transit is hiring. And there also, there's going to be the pilot for the zero emission bus going from Sacramento up to Tahoe. Yeah, you can sign up to ride that. Um, <laughs> so that will... <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> there's going to be a pilot ride of a zero emission bus, electric bus, oh. that's going to make the trip to Tahoe. And I didn't... Does it, does, do you have to wait like six hours until you can make the trip back? <laughs> To I, was, I was surprised to hear that. I didn't realize that the they had figured out the topographic challenges of getting up there. Um, so that's, that's interesting. But Everybody has to get out and push. Do you remember what date that's going to I can't remember which weekend. I can't remember, doing that. But, but if you contact El Dorado Transit, I'm um, sure they'll hook but you, you up. But you can go see it and, you know. I, I hope it does well. But I, I was I didn't realize that we were quite that close to being able to go all the way up to 27, yeah. Well, isn't that why we bought all those electric buses? Mm. Well, that's why we spent so much money that's on what I mean. strategic plan to convert our buses to electric buses. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, El Dorado County Transportation Commission? I was not at my best that day, so I'm not going to comment. Well, I brought I, I this, in, if yeah. you want a, a reminder of what we talked about. The um, project monitoring report was kind of the do you, bulk. Yeah. Do you want to look at that? I've got it check mark with it. He explained um, what we talked about uh, yeah, that concerns Placerville. Mm -hmm. I don't think we got an update on the Greater Placerville Wildfire Evacuation mm -hmm. Preparedness Community Safety and Resiliency Plan. If there's ever a need for an acronym, it's for that <laughs> plan right <Yeah>. there. <laughs> We we talked about that, and they, they did a great update, but it's still, you know, they talked also, we're going to circle back around on the, the fact that it's still data, and we're waiting to see what that comes of that. Right. And uh, so then uh, you talked, to, you, you we, mentioned one thing just a second ago, the, um, oh, the the project plan, the project. Yeah, uh, the monitoring report. Yeah, monitoring yeah. report. And I, and I'll, I'll encourage anybody who's interested in what's going on in the city to, or in the county, uh, it, it, it's a full plan of every project that is on that is planned for for future for future or is in current development right now and they're all in here and they tell you where they're at how much they're funded how much is funding is needed and uh, and they tell you whether they're on time or not and those guys do a great job of laying out all the significant projects that are being funded through state, local, CMAC funding, all sorts of different sources. So it's a great place to, to find out about which. And that was, a, that was the bulk of the meeting. Yeah, and that's available at their website mm -hmm. for members of the public to go check out. I, re I refer to that document a lot throughout mm -hmm. the year on just, I mean, I'm curious about, you know, what, what's this construction happening here? What project is this? Or... You know, if, if something's on track or how it's being funded, it's, it's a good document. Yeah. Um, there was a bunch of So the, the things that uh, involved Placerville was the uh, Main Street, Cedar Ravine, Clay Street intersection, mm -hmm. um, the Canal Street Bicycle and Pedestrian Improvement Project, Phase 2, mm -hmm. uh, the Cambellic Road Sidewalk Project, and that was all I have marked for, yeah. oh, no, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Oh, and then they, they brought us up to date on the Camino Safety Project. I know a lot of folks, even though it's Camino, well, there's so many questions on when is that thing going to be completed. Yeah. I think it's nearing completion. I'm hoping that nothing else goes wrong. Um, and then the other one was the, um, the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. And, boy, that's got an acronym. Chris, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Surface Transportation Block Grant Program Projects. Uh, so yeah, the, and like Dennis said, go online and pull this up. It's mm -hmm. great. Um, this yeah. and then, there there was a, an update on the Greater Placerville Wildfire Evacuation Preparedness Community Safety and Resil Resiliency Plan. Mm -hmm. They they love these titles, <laughs> and it, it's and it's something that's uh, that a, a large part of our community is involved with. At least the. Uh, uh, public safety, every aspect of uh, different people that touch um, wildfire evacuation preparedness. And so 
uh, th that is a that is a still ongoing project, and uh, the next coordination meeting is scheduled for October 26 to start coordinating, pu coordinating public outreach. So, it is that is still in motion, and we look forward to you know future conversations on how that goes. And you know we joke about this acronym thing. Mm -hmm. So part of this monitoring program, they <laughs> provide, and this is the acronym. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's just the tip of the iceberg. And there's yeah. no way I can memorize that. Yeah. <laughs> Three pages of that. Yeah. Okay. That's right. it. That's it for transit. Lafco. That's pressure. Yeah. Okay. Lafco, we finally hired an EO. Right. Shiva Frenzen is the new EO okay. for Lafco. So there we did that. We held a public hearing and adopted small to medium water and wastewater district MSRs and sphere of influence updates. We formed an ad hoc committee for the City of Placerville, City of South Lake Tahoe, and Cameron Park CSD for the MSR and SOI study. That's Municipal Service Review and Sur Sphere of Influence, all those acronyms. Um, Commissioner White wanted to let everyone know there is a charter review committee for the county. They met the first time yesterday, but he wanted to make sure everybody um, knew that there are four things being considered um, to increase the amount of Board of Supervisor members to eliminate term limits, um, to consider different election uh, cycles for seven elected uh, department heads and to combine elected offices. Um, so if you go to the El Dorado County Legistar where you see the Board of Supervisor agendas, you can look up um, the Charter Review Committee and find out when their next meeting is and um, contact those people to give comments and thoughts hmm. about those items. Interesting. All right. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, SACOG. Uh, we'll meet next week. Pioneer. Um, attended the audit review committee. And, and basically, that's going through auditing, <laughs> which is the most boring part of, <laughs> of any financial part. But I don't know. Maybe you love Sorry, Dave. <laughs> I know. I know every, per, every you know every organization we deal with that goes through an audit is like, ugh, we got to do the audit again. I think that was the same thing at fire, wasn't it? <laughs> fire State Council, Patty. Well, I think Sue's program tonight pretty much brought us up to date on what's All going right. on. Uh, two by two has not met, and Opportunity Knox. Um, I attended that on Friday, and not much to report. They. They did a recap of a lot of things, summaries. Okay. Um, request for future agenda items. No? Okay. Staff reports, item 15. And we have our monthly police stats. Chief Friend, would you like to highlight anything for the public? Uh, I would, thank you. Um, while they're fresh in my mind, there were two incidents last week that I would like to highlight. Um, <laughs> last Monday, a, a very tragic incident occurred just outside our city limits in the county. Uh, our officers were, requ were requested to respond, uh, and in arriving on the scene, they located uh, the suspect hiding in the ve vegetation, at which time they took him into custody and turned him over to the uh, uh, investigating agency. Uh, that was a homicide incident right outside the city limits. So um, kudos to our team for um, their head on a swivel and, and using sound tactics and actually uh, looking before they, they leaped and uh, took a very violent, dangerous person into custody. Uh, last Thursday, our crime reduction team worked with the uh, United States Marshals uh, Violent Fugitive Task Force to locate, apprehend, and remove uh, a violent wanted fugitive from our city. So that was uh, good work on their on their behalf. It was an all day incident. Um, and I uh, made sure to tell Sergeant Cadow to pass on to the to the fugitive that they're not welcome here and please don't come back. Um, <clears throat> other than that, I can review anything on the staff report that you uh, have questions on. Uh, you will notice that I included our kind of running tally. That for us internally, uh, is how we measure our monthly. Uh, the, the stats that we provide you um, previously are year-over-year -year comparison of that month. So that would be helpful other than we need to attach a, a legend or key to it to help with some of the uh, acronyms <laughs> that we know. Uh, 
but may not be known to, to others. So um, a lot of good work being done at the police department. Uh, we got a comment today that they're seeing more um, transient uh, uh, subjects. Uh, they appear to be transient walking around town. That's not unexpected because of the disruption we've done to the encampments on private properties. So they're looking for a place to land, and our staff is um, uh, contacting them throughout the day to ensure that uh, they're doing okay and if there's any services we can provide to them. Any questions? I don't have any questions, but uh, today in the newspaper, you were the police department was featured with your new program. Yeah, the crime reduction team. I was just yeah. wondering um, if you that what you were just saying, but it's yeah. too new, right, to really. Uh, they've been they've been going kind of strong probably for the last six weeks. Okay, it took them a minute to to form and um, for us to kind of figure out. I mean, we had conceptually an idea of how we would uh, deploy them, but uh, we wanted to make sure that um, we're meeting the, the the goals and the expectations of the community, uh, addressing those quality of life issues. Um, they're also running two pretty significant investigations right now that I I, I don't want to discuss, but. Um, because of this program? I mean, uh, because of this team. Of if we didn't have this team, we couldn't run these two investigations. Okay. So, yeah. So. Well, since I don't understand all that goes on in law enforcement, I don't really understand that, why, you know, it, mm -hmm. it took this. But I just congratulate you on starting this program and, and ha hoping that it's really going to be a success. It, you know, it's it, the thanks really goes to the council for funding the position, funding the supervisor position. Um, we combined a couple other positions uh, to create this team, but without that infield supervision, it would have been, I mean, I have a lot of faith and confidence in, in my staff, but we need that direct supervisor out there to ensure that, um, you know, the team understands what they're doing, why they're doing it, and... Uh, and get the results that we're looking for. So thank you guys. Um, one, one question on the crime reduction team table. Yes. If it's site, arrest, tense, and contacts. Is tense like tense or is it an abbreviation for something else? It's tense. So Those it's are like ones. How many tents you've spotted or? We've marked for, uh, we've marked for immediate abatement. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just want to say that I've noticed the data on this has gotten much more in depth and thorough with this report. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're trying. That's the only. It, it you know it's it's odd that it's taken us this long to get up to where we we need to be. Really, it's the systems that we use are are not the greatest, but we're fixing that as well. So. All right. Any other questions or comments for Chief Ren? All right, and then fifteen point two. This is the. Um, fire chief's report. Would you like to highlight anything, Chief Cordero? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a couple things. I'll try to up the data on ours. We're using about a 54-year-old system right now, so I'll see if I can't get a newer one for you. Well, you yeah, have we really have nice pictures, pictures yes. so I appreciate And, you those. know, I would like to comment on that. The, uh, the bottom two pictures uh, last month uh, in September, we attended the uh, IFF, the International Association of Firefighters, Fall Memorial Service in uh, Colorado Springs, where one of our firefighters, uh, Brandon Hoostry, was placed on the wall. Uh, Brandon passed away in 2019 from um, occupational cancer. He was only with us for a few months before he got diagnosed and went through his treatment, but uh, his whole time with County Fire was spent at Station 25. So um, that was finally due to COVID. We were able to, uh, to see him put on the wall, which was a really good ceremony. And then secondly, just to bring the council up to date, there was an incident, unfortunately, that took place Sunday evening over at the Placeville Fire Center which is where the um, CAL FIRE uh, hand crews are at. They uh, had a fire with one of their uh, crew buses um, in the process of extinguishing the fire. They did have two of their members that were pretty significantly burned. They're both in a burn unit right now, and so I would just ask the, the council and the community to, to keep those firefighters and their families in, in mind as they have a bit of a recovery ahead of them. But with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. All right. Well, thank you for that update. I was had to hear about that incident on Sunday. Um, do we know what the cause of the fire was? I got this from my buddy Joe. It's under investigation. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are, we are thinking of the, the firefighters that were wounded in that incident. 
I do. I do have a question uh, with with regards to the the um, stand down on one of the units of the over at forty nine, the medic unit. Is that um, how's how's that going? Is there any hope to have it manned uh, uh, up again, or is that just kind of a static situation right now with uh, having that one more unit offline? No. I, I don't know what is the status of that. I guess the status of that is uh, hopefully at the JPA board meeting later this month we'll entertain some um, interest from some other agencies to stand that unit up. Um, County Fire in particular, um, we're trying to work with uh, Diamond Springs see if we could assist them. If not, uh, it's standing up a medic unit is, is not an easy task, mm -hmm. and uh, so we we do have four units right now. So for us to stand up fifth, um, we could take that on if we need to. But the system needs it. Uh, the crews are really, uh, they're getting stretched pretty thin. And, uh, you know, I frequently get across my phone that, uh, you know, the system's at level zero, which means there's no ambulances available in the county. Right. So it's its something that we have to get mitigated quickly. How, how, do, how does that reach, I mean, it, it, you don't want to hear, you know, it, it's its a drawdown to zero. Really, ever. I mean, thats that's bad news. What 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 is there any like uh, I'm, what's the right word? Is there any um, any oper worst case scenario? How do we how do we institute an emergency plan where we you know I don't know do you mutual well well there's there's already mutual aid because they'll pull Folsom in when that happens but um, but is there any circumstance that we would have to go out and you know draw people in from Sacramento hire them up or or, you know, what do we do? I mean, let's say we don't have, there's no staffing. I mean, because I know staffing short is short everywhere. I mean, we're getting to the point where we're running, we're drawing down our, our medic units. So we do have mutual aid plans with in place with Sacramento County mm -hmm. and with our partners up on the East Slope and Service Area 3. And we yeah. can utilize uh, units from there. They, they call our units down there, unfortunately, because... Mm -hmm. They're in the same uh, same issue. Right. Uh, the the crux of the problem is is the lack of firefighter paramedics mm -hmm. that are available nationwide. Um, side note: When I was in uh, Colorado Springs, I spoke with a gentleman from Col uh, Canada, and their system is incredibly worse off than ours. But we are looking at some alternative staffing models to mm -hmm. to bring those units back online, and uh, it is. Uh, challenging when you hear when we're down at level one or even two if there's two ambulances covering the county that ambulance could be you know plasterable going to volcanoville and mm -hmm. that's a long haul so we, we do you have utilized are you are are you utilizing somebody to do the transfers now so that's kind of taking that off of the plate a little bit yes fortunately um just prior to the down staff you know medic 49 we got out of the the majority of the inner facility transfers okay. which was about 150 calls a month okay all right thank you any other questions, comments? Um, I would open the staff reports up to the public if anyone would like to comment on either 15.1 or 15.2. Had a quick question on the police report. I saw that there's higher uh, misdemeanor arrests this year than previous years, pretty significantly, and I'm wondering if that's resulted to the new. Um, crime response task unit or if we just have more folks in our community committing them now so any insight on that thank you Nicole all right I will close public comment uh, chief friend would you like to address that I know that our police officers have been proactive lately but I'm not sure if that's if we're also just seeing more crime um, no, it's it's mostly DUIs. So we saw a 39% increase in, in um, DUI arrests. Um, and you're you know you're hard pressed to find a felony anymore after they changed the law. So uh, there's just more. What used to be a felony is a misdemeanor at this time. So um, that's uh, I think that's it. Drug arrests. I know we're seeing a um, uptick in those, but Okay, so what you're saying in terms of the felony and misdemeanor is that because of how they reclassified felonies as misdemeanors, there's just more 
crimes in the category of misdemeanors as being counted for that statistic? Right. Prop, Prop 47 changed all on narcotic offenses from felonies to misdemeanors. So, I mean, that could be. But looking at the stats now, um, in comparison to last year, we saw 39. We see a 39 percent increase over this time last year of our misdemeanor arrests and DUIs. So, okay. And then some marginal increases in other areas. Have you seen fentanyl in our community? There's a lot of it. Yes. Right now, the, the okay, yeah. I, I, along those lines, I did talk to Cleve about it, and I don't know if he talked to you about it, but um, it seems to me that, um, especially Sacramento, but I'm hearing on the news that the 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 cities and the everybody's getting really concerned about this fentanyl situation, and I'm wondering, do, do you keep in contact with, I, I know you do, <laughs> the contact with the school system, or um, is this something that maybe we need to maybe highlight a little bit? Um, I don't know. What do we do? It's, <clears throat> so specifically the fentanyl pills, it's it's easier for, it, and it's coming out of the, the cartels, out of, out of um, um, southern, southern border. Um, it's easier for them to smuggle in the the powder, several pounds of it, and then sit with a pill press and make 500,000 fentanyl pills over a weekend and then distribute them throughout the United States. So it's an easier product to distribute, to, manuf to bring into the country, to manufacture, and then distribute than any other of the uh, controlled substances that we had previously dealt with. So. Well, I understand that, but yeah. I'm wondering if... It, to me, it just seems like we're almost heading for a crisis. Um, we're already we're already there. And we're in the crisis. Uh, so, do we need to do some kind of a community outreach? I mean, or I, I don't, edu yeah, education. Um, I don't know. Is that something we can assist the schools with? I, I, that's what I'm asking. I, I know that I know that Edco is is in com conversation about that very subject. Um, the the meat of that conversation I'm not aware of. I know I know that they are having it. Um, you know, as as far as community awareness, we I mean we could do something. We can push something out, but it's already it's it's already it's been here. And we're if we say hey, there's a fentanyl crisis, they're going to be like, yeah, that was a year ago. Okay, so, so. And, but my. What I'm, I think, I know what I'm asking is, we, I, I keep hearing parents that have lost a child because a child tried it one time because they ordered the wrong, you know, they ordered a pill and it came in. So they're advocating for more um, caution in the schools and, I mean, or, or this information working on the kids. And I, you know, um, I, I just, like I say, um, Right. It's, I don't. I don't have any going to that. Um, I. I don't want to drive in the lane of the school district. I think that they're probably the most appropriate uh, organization to disseminate that information amongst their schools. They have that that avenue and pipeline, and, and we would absolutely help them uh, with that. But um, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, what we can yeah. do is inquire at the schools. We have good contacts there. Yeah and find out what their plans are and what they're doing and, and report back to you what, yeah. what things are right. going on. The, the sheriff actually has a program that goes into schools and reaches mm -hmm. into schools and does education mm -hmm. uh, with, on We on do drugs. the same. Well, it, it's, is it a joint thing or is it? No, it's done through the SROs. Okay, SROs. The, the presentations are done through the school oh, resource okay. officers. Okay. And, but does he not go into the ones that are in the city limits, the schools? We or? have our own SRO. We, in that same pro is that yeah. part of that program or the funding and such the, for the all the literature officers? and all those types of things that go along with that? Yeah, I would I would imagine. Yeah, okay. I don't know what's I don't. I know I donate to a yeah. to a program for that funds those programs in our schools in this community, yeah. and so it's more than likely through Edco, mm -hmm. and that the information is given to the SROs from Edco. Yeah to deliver that presentation. Okay. Because the schools are very regimented about what is presented to their student bodies. Okay. Right. I just know that there's program that there is a program out there that is So that what is about um, the areas beyond the schools? The people that are out there that are not going to school. 
the young people that are floundering. Is there some sort of an outreach to them? I, I, other, than, like, other than normal social interactions they have with their their peer groups or, or stuff like that I mean it's f fentanyl I would I would be completely shocked if I ran into somebody and I, I, I mentioned fentanyl to them and they had no clue what I was talking okay. about. okay yeah okay well uh, what um, what's his name that spoke uh, the, the preacher oh, Jonathan. <laughs> Jonathan right. and talked about that one incident at the mother load motel, you know, and it's like, so do well, these people at the mother load motel, do they? Yeah. We, we hear about these, Oh, there was an overdose, but we self administered Narcan. They never report that to us officially. And I don't know if they do it to the medic units or the hospital. Okay. So we don't know if their data is actually factual. We know we've had uh, opiate overdose deaths in the city because we've responded to the death report and there's only been uh i believe one up at the hotel one maybe two so okay. it, it, it's a it's a very dangerous drug and it's a drug that you don't want to experiment with right. you don't want to use any drugs at all but don't don't say yeah i'm just gonna you know like it's not a it's not marijuana it's not it it is something that will shut your system down um and so Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, item 16, upcoming agenda items. There's there's a list that folks can read in their own time. Um, just a couple extra mile day proclamation, Hangtown Creek culvert, um, construction contracts. There's there's several. So I will I'll leave it at that. And it is 8:13. I will adjourn this meeting until October 25th. All right. Good night, everyone.